Hello, fictional. Welcome to the What If Issei. Today we are gonna see, What If Issei Got Harem With Sona. Part 2. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Have fun, Issei. Be careful. Haidu Ryo called after her son and turned towards her husband. Think it's a girl. The bee, Haidu Goru said thoughtfully. He's been spending a lot of time with those student council girls lately. The salaryman, so far as his son knew, anyway, smiled faintly. It's his heritage shining through. Ryo snorted in amusement. I hope it's that president girl, what's her name Shitori, that's right. She seems sensible, even if she probably is a devil. She paused before swatting her husband's arm playfully, this conversation could easily go in melancholy directions, and she didn't want to ruin their mood. And where are those other girls of yours now, Goru-kun? The worthwhile one stuck around, he answered, his smile wan but present. He took her hand and rose with a grace his son never would have credited him with. Feel like dinner out. Sweetaker, Ryo said, her cheek slightly red. She was inwardly relieved, discussing Daria and everything that had followed wasn't how she wanted to spend the evening. Let me change real quick. Where were you thinking? As she was speaking, she waved one hand in an invocational gesture, and her jeans and blouse were replaced by cargo pants and a thick sweater. Let's see if that place in Hackadate is still open, Goru suggested, opening the door to the backyard. He muttered to himself for a moment, a simple noise suppression spell to ward off nosy neighbors. I haven't had a good long flight in a while. Try and avoid air control radar this time, please, Ryo told him dryly. Another wave of the hand and twenty years fell away from her features. Better. I'll say, Goru agreed, making a show of looking her up and down. I do like how you look as a mom, though. He closed his eyes and exhaled, and his own face lost its years and miles. The result was a young man who looked like a slightly older essay. You'd better, she chided him playfully. Are the ward said. Yep. They stepped outside, and Goru changed. Scales sprouted out, his body shifted and lengthened. When he was finished, an eastern dragon rested on its haunches in the backyard. Hop on, pretty lady, Goru's voice boomed out. I've never heard that one before, Ryo laughed. She settled onto his back with the ease of long practice, though, and her husband sprang into the sky. That place in Hakodate was a teppanyaki restaurant, a place full of bright memories from a happier time. It was, indeed, still open, and now run by an old friend of theirs. The tanuki was from Fukuoka, and his skill behind a stove was only matched by his appetite. They had also been fortunate in their timing. Several of their other acquaintances had decided to eat there that night as well, and it had become an impromptu party. Really, it was the best date night that Goru and Ryo had had in several years. So, it was almost predictable when it was ruined. Hey, Goru-kun. Takamichi, the proprietor, poked his head out of the kitchen. You and Ryo-chan still live in Kuo, right? That's right, why? Goro looked up from his beer. The Kyoto Observer in Kuo is reporting some kind of dust-up. The normally jovial Tanuki had a cell phone pressed to one ear, and he looked unwontedly concerned. Something about a fallen angel and a devil getting into it. What? Goro was out of his seat before he quite realized it. He looked at Ryo, whose expression was equally alarmed. She rose as well, and they both walked over to the kitchen door. Akamichi held up a hand, listening to the person on the other hand. Okay okay, thanks, Shizuku-san thank you. Yeah, I owe you. He ended the call and turned back to Goru and Ryo. Okay, it sounds like things are under control. I guess a fallen angel got into a scrap with someone that one of the local devils has close ties with and the devil sent the crow packing. Ryo exchanged glances with her husband and he nodded. She stepped away from him, fishing her own cell phone out of her purse and dialed Issei's phone. After several rings, he picked up, the sounds of a restaurant could be heard faintly in the background. Hello, Kasan. They say. Is everything okay? You're not up to any trouble, right? She kept her tone light, faintly teasing. She could hear the embarrassed exasperation in his voice. What yes, yes, I'm fine, I'm having dinner with friends, remember? Ah, yes, that's right. You didn't hear about anything weird happening tonight, did you? No, I don't know anything about weird stuff happening tonight. Issei's voice had the right notes of confusion and mild indignation. You're sure? Ryo repeated. Yeah. He was starting to sound agitated. Those friends he was eating with. At least one of them had to be a girl. Probably the girl, Ryo knew how to tell when her son was crushing on someone. Alright, just wanted to make sure. Be careful on your way home, alright. Yeah, okay, I'll be careful on the way home. Issei sounded like he was starting to settle down now. It'll probably be late, we're talking about seeing a movie. Try and make it home before midnight, then, Ryo said, then smiled evilly. I'm sure your date's parents want her home at a reasonable hour, too. She could hear the blush in his voice. 
It's people from the student council, Kasan, it's not a date. Ryo had to suppress a giggle. Are you sure it's not? A friend of mine met her husband when they were working on the student council together. Lots of time alone, talking intensely. No, Kasan, last time I checked, the school's e-learning site doesn't make for romantic conversation, his tone was plaintive, begging her to change the topic. All right, Issei. I'll let you get back to your friends. Try and keep it down if you get home late. Yes, Kasan. I'll keep it down when I get home. Love you, bye he sounded relieved to end the call. Ryo let the giggle out this time. Her son was too cute not to tease sometimes. Bora looked back over at her. Issei's all right. Yes, Ryo told her husband. He's probably neck deep in whatever happened, but I doubt he was the instigator. That's one kind of trouble I've never worried about from him. Bora nodded, looking resigned, and turned towards Takamichi. Can we settle up? Sure, Takamichi answered. As the debit card was running, he added, oh, Kuroka-chan was in here last month. The hiatus froze again. Ryo found her voice first. Was she? Takamichi hesitated, then reached under the register and passed her a folded slip of notebook paper. She left this in case you came by again. As opposed to actually calling us. Goru said darkly. That's just. Boru-kun, that's enough, Ryo said, softly but firmly. She took the paper. Thank you, Takamichi-san. Are you feeling better now? Ryo asked as they landed in the backyard. A roundabout trip skimming the Sea of Japan had once been Goro's preferred way of cooling off. Ryo didn't mind it, despite the chill and the sea spray, a few minor incantations were enough to stave off the ill effects of those. Yeah, Goro admitted, waiting until his wife had dismounted before returning to his human form. Thank you for sitting through that, Ryo. It's all right, she assured him, opening the back door. I wasn't much happier to hear about it. Between that and what almost happened to Issei. I know, he agreed. Let's check on him. It's after midnight, he has to be home. Ryo nodded in agreement. Issei was, indeed, in bed and asleep. That much was as expected. The fact that he and a girl were curled around each other, though, that was well, it was less expected. The fact that it was the student council president herself wasn't that surprising, though. At least they're both still dressed, Goru said philosophically, sounding like he was trying to suppress a belly laugh. So she's the girl, hmm? Ryo said, smiling genuinely. She's probably the one who saved his life tonight. As if to confirm this, their son mumbled Sona-chan just loudly enough for them to hear, and tightened his arms around her. For her part, Sona-chan just burrowed deeper into his embrace. There was a brief flash of light, and Ryo shot her husband a mildly annoyed look. Did you just snap a photo? Yes, I did. Goru tucked the phone back into his pocket. Shall we let them sleep? It'll be more fun to wake them in the morning if we do, Ryo agreed, and started pushing Goru towards their bedroom. Saturday. There was nothing better than waking up next to a cute girl who was only wearing panties and a button-down shirt. Well, Issei thought with no small amount of satisfaction, if that girl happens to be your new fiancé, I guess that does make it even better. He hadn't had a chance to see her sleeping face the first night she'd stayed. What he saw this morning more than made up for it. Even though he knew her face well enough to recognize subtle expressions, this was the first time he'd seen her looking so unguarded, so relaxed. She was beautiful when she was awake, even when she was coldly angry. Asleep and free of worries, she was breathtaking. He reached out, gently touching her face. She started slightly, eyes half opening, and her lips curled into a smile. Issei kun. Morning, Sona chan, he whispered, leaning close. His mouth brushed hers, and as they kissed, she stretched her arms and wrapped them lightly around his neck. MMM, I think I can get used to this, he said with a grin. Good, she murmured, stretching again before drawing him back down beside her. She opened her eyes slowly, blinking as she took in the mid-morning sunlight. It was a new experience, seeing her sans glasses. It was just another side to her that he found fascinating. I'd like us to stay in bed all day, you know, she added with a sleepy smile. Me too, he said, brushing her hair back from her eyes, before smiling resignedly. I don't suppose we can. No, Sona sighed. What time is it? We have the council meeting in the afternoon, so we can bring you and Kiryu-san up to speed. Issei craned his neck and was just barely able to see the clock. Looks like 8.30. He blanched. 8. It's an off Saturday, Sona reminded him. We don't have to get up just yet, she added with a smile. I definitely don't want to, he said, looking a little frantic. But Ka-san's probably working on breakfast right now, so. The knock at his door startled them both. A moment later, Issei's father's voice rang out. Issei, your mom has breakfast ready. Okay, Tusan, I'll be right down. Issei called out, starting to stand. Sona reached for her glasses, looking around for her school uniform. Your mom made plenty, so tell Shatori-san she's welcome to join us. 
The Sei and Sona both froze. Their eyes met, their faces mirroring each other in mortification. The worst part was the obvious smile in Issei's father's voice. Issei closed his eyes and made a go-ahead gesture. Sona donned her glasses, sighed, and answered, Thank you, Haidu-san. I've been happy to join you two and Issei-kun. Come on down as soon as you're ready. You two can tell us about your date last night. If anything, the smile in Haidu Goru's voice sounded like it had just widened. Issei and Sona looked at each other for a long moment, then burst out laughing. There really wasn't anything else to do. Issei recovered first, giving her an affectionate look. Well, at least they like you. Sona was red-faced, a look that made Issei want to pull her back down to the bed. That must be a good sign, she agreed. I suppose we should go down, then. After dressing, of course. She smirked. Only you get to see this, Issei-kun. So, how was dinner? Ryo, Sona had made a point of learning Issei's parents' names, back when she realized she was developing feelings for him, asked with a sly smile. Like her husband, she seemed greatly amused by how embarrassed her son and his new girlfriend seemed. It was fine, Issei said. His face was cherry red, and he had a death grip on Sona's hand underneath the table. She squeezed back, silently encouraging him. Anything you two want to tell us? Goru added lazily. Issei took a deep breath and straightened up. Tusan, Kasan, there's something I need to tell you. He rose stiffly, his back ramrod straight. Sona-chan and I are getting married. Not right away, he added quickly. After we're done with school. Maybe after we're done with college. But we've decided, we love each other and we're gonna get married. There was a stunned silence at the table. Clearly, they hadn't expected that bomb to be dropped on them. At least, not separate from more awkward news. Sona reached for his arm. Issei-kun, relax, she said softly. Sit back down. As he did so, she rose, turning her eyes back towards his parents. He's absolutely correct, though. You may have noticed that we've grown steadily closer over the last school year. Last night, we talked at length about this and came to that conclusion. She bowed to Issei's parents. I know he would be happy for us to receive your blessing, and I would be as well. Boru and Ryo exchanged looks, then smiled and shook their heads. Ryo looked at the two of them. I don't see how we can refuse if you two feel that way and have actually thought it out. It helps that you're not rushing to get hitched for the obvious reason, Goru added with a smirk. Dusan. Issei snapped. We haven't he cut himself off, Fasipaming. I'm just gonna shut up and eat my breakfast now, he muttered. Smart boy, Goru said, reaching across the table to clap his son on his shoulder. I wish I'd been that sensible at your age. As the atmosphere in the dining room relaxed, Sona silently glanced at her future parents-in-law. She was silently pleased that they were rolling with this so easily, but that raised some questions in of itself. Something about this seemed not bad, but unusual. She closed her eyes for a moment, reaching out her magical senses. Honestly, she was at a loss as to explain why she hadn't done this before. Hmm. They almost read as normal oh. The house. Someone had laid some powerful and subtle enchantments into the foundation, and those were subtly affecting her attempts at sensing. Not by much, but just enough that the two of them kept reading as almost perfectly normal. What are you two? She wondered. Issei displayed no sign whatsoever that there might be anything unusual about his parents. And they definitely weren't hostile towards her, so she didn't want to disrupt that. The best thing was probably to let this rest for the moment. It was a mystery, though. Sona had a hard time resisting mysteries. And it was one linked to her fiancé, which made it twice as tempting. Have you come to a decision, Murayama-san? Yeah. Murayama looked like she was still ambivalent, but was committed to a course of action anyway. What Kiryu-san said last night, about joining up in order to get some control over what happens to me, made a lot of sense. So, yeah, I'll join up too. You said something about being a knight, right? What's that entail? We'll be glad to have you, Mireyama-san, Sona said, inclining her head politely towards the Kondoka. Actually, if everyone's comfortable, we can begin the orientation and bring our new members up to speed. Issei glanced around the room. The members of the student council, plus its newest member, himself, Kiryu and Mureyama, were gathered in the living room of Sona's apartment. It was a surprisingly spacious one-bedroom flat near the school campus and was tastefully appointed in a minimalist style. Yet, if you knew what you were looking for, you'd find the small touches that showed Sona's personality. Issei was starting to know what he was looking for. Everyone gathered was in casual clothing, this being a Saturday off from school. It was an interesting education in what people chose to dress when not required to wear a uniform. He himself was dressed pretty simply, in blue jeans and a red button-down shirt over his favorite black six stages of debugging t-shirt. Sona wore a grey denim skirt and a white shirt that hey, wait, that's one of my school shirts. It sure looks better on her than it does on me. As if sensing what he was thinking, his fiancée looked his way and smiled faintly. 
He was starting to be able to tell the subtle differences between her small smiles now, this one, he knew, was the rough equivalent to another girl's flirtatious grin and come hither eyes. It had the same effect as well, warming his cheek slightly. Sorry, sorry Kusaka came in, bearing a tray with everyone's drinks. She distributed them, taking hers and Issei's last. She handed him his coke as she sat beside him, paused to read his t-shirt, and snorted in amusement. He glanced at her fruits de mer t-shirt and returned the favor. We still need to find a pretext for Murayama san and Kiryu san joining us regularly, Saji said stonily. The council secretary wore fashionable slacks and a polo shirt, but his expression detracted from his handsomeness. It's too soon to make another announcement about a new council member, especially with the new rumors about Haidu. He pointedly avoided looking at Issei. I have an idea for that, Tsubaki answered, looking at Sona. The vice president wore a simple black dress, and her long mane of even hair was gathered into a thick ponytail and draped over her left shoulder. Club delegates to the council. That seems sensible, Sona agreed, looking at Murayama. If I arrange that with Yagashi-san, are you willing to do that? It will mean some busy work, but not that much. Sure, Murayama said with a shrug. She was dressed in black cargo pants and a blue blouse worn over a grey fitted t-shirt. Her hair was back in a single ponytail today instead of her normal twin tails, a fact that kept causing Issei to wonder why a stranger was in the room with him. I'm not part of any club, though, Kiryu pointed out. She wore shorts and a sweatshirt, a somewhat contradictory combination that she somehow managed to make look good. Sonda glanced at her fiancé. Issei-kun, you never officially dissolved the programming club, did you? Nope, it's still on the books, Issei told her. Never got anyone else interested in it, though. Not even Mitsuda or Motohama, not when I told them it wouldn't just be for watching internet porn. Well, now you have your first recruit, the council president said with a note of amiable finality. I guess that works, Issei said, looking at Kiryu. Welcome to the programming club, then, Fukubachu-san. No internet porn, though, I'm afraid. I'm sure I'll survive, Kiryu replied dryly. The two of them shared a good-natured smirk. Well. Since that settled Sona shifted so that she was facing the others. Tsubaki sat next to her, assuming the position of second in command even now. The high-class devil reached out with one hand, and the same finely crafted box that Issei had seen her use last night appeared. She opened it, extracting a pawn piece. This is an evil piece. These are what we use to reincarnate humans and other sentient beings into devils. So there's a kind of chess theme to this? Kiryu asked curiously. How far does that extend? Tsona inclined her head to Kiryu, apparently pleased by her insight. I'm glad you asked that. All devils have, in comparison to humans, greater strength and resilience, as well as a much longer lifespan, but there is a lot that's determined by the piece you're reincarnated as. She held up the pawn piece. The pawn is the basic unit of measurement for a reincarnated devil's power. Don't be fooled by the name, the pawn is neither expendable nor impotent, at least not in a properly run peerage. Peerage? Murayama asked, leaning forward. High-class devils, those who have worked their way up in rank or were born into the nobility, receive sets of evil pieces to create their own groups of servants, Sona explained. These are called peerages and are modeled on chessets, with the high-class devil as king and master of the peerage. You mentioned working our way up in rank, Issei said, remembering Sona's words from the previous night. Yes. Reincarnated devils can earn promotion in underworld society. Once you become a high-class devil, you receive the right to form your own peerage, and if you achieve ultimate class devil rank, you can even receive a grant of land to develop as you see fit. Sona paused, letting that sink in, then added. I'd like to come back to rank advancement. We should cover the functions of the evil pieces she looked up as the doorbell rang. That should be the pizza. Haruko, if you would, please my pocketbook is on my computer desk. Haruko nodded and trotted off to fetch the food. As she did, Sona continued, as I was saying, the pawn is an important piece because it has the power of promotion. That is, a pawn can assume the traits and powers of any other piece while in enemy territory. This works both in combat and in the rating games that we use to increase our social standing in devil society. I'll come back to those as well. She looked over at Kiryu. Both Saji-kun and Veruko are pawns, Kiryu-san. You'll be reincarnated as one as well. Kiryu quirked an eyebrow. How much will that affect my ability to learn magic? None at all, Sona assured her. If it were possible, I'd prefer to reincarnate you as a bishop, who are magic specialists, but Momo and Ria are already my bishops. But there will be nothing stopping you from learning and gaining proficiency in magic, particularly as you grow in power. Kiryu nodded, looking mostly mollified. Sona replaced a pawn piece and retrieved a knight, holding it aloft. Murayama san, I intend to make you a knight, like Tomo. They have exceptional reflexes and precision, traits that lend themselves to weapon users. A knight's intrinsic defense is low, though. 
Generally, you'll have to rely upon your mobility to survive in combat. I see, Murayama murmured. She lapsed into silence, clearly contemplating how to best make use of those traits. Not for the first time, Issei couldn't help finding that look of thoughtful concentration cute. Not for the first time, he tried to strangle the thought. Tsonda was speaking again. Rooks are I think the term for modern gaming is tanks. They have exceptional strength and stamina, making them excellent close-in fighters, but they also have low mobility. She gestured first at Tsubasa, then at Issei. Tsubasa is a rook, and I reincarnated Issei Kun as one last night. Ira caught Issei's eye and smiled, holding out a fist. Issei had to shake his head and smile in return, reaching out and tapping his knuckles against hers. Sona smirked good-naturedly at the brief byplay and continued. As I said, Ria and Momo are my bishops. They're magic specialists with exceptional spellcasting ability, but also with low defense. She shot an approving look at Kusaka. Not that the latter keeps them from having courage in the crunch, as Ria demonstrated last night. Kusaka pinked slightly under the praise. Issei gave her a grin of thanks as well. Tsona continued speaking, looking amused at the byplay between her rooks. Finally, Tsubaki is my queen. The student council vice president bowed, the effect slightly ruined by the Ramune bottle in one hand. The queen is typically the peerage's second in command and is also the most powerful and balanced piece, having all the advantages of the knight, bishop and rook, with none of the drawbacks. I assume that's why there's only one queen per peerage, Kiryu commented dryly. Probably, Sona answered in a matching tone. Each peerage has a total of eight pawn pieces, two knights, two bishops, two rooks, and one queen. Aruko chose that moment to return, with a stack of paper plates and several pizza and appetizer boxes. Lunch is served, she said brightly. I think that's a good place to take a break and process, Sona said, opening to top box. For a while the only sounds in the apartment were those of high school students eating lunch. Issei took the opportunity to sit next to Sona, and she seemed to brighten considerably from his proximity. As conversation began to pick up again, Murayama looked thoughtful. Which came first, this or chess? Chess, I believe, Sona told her. The evil pieces system has been in place for at least six centuries, perhaps longer. She actually looked slightly abashed at not having the answer immediately at hand. I'm not precisely sure how long, honestly. It's okay, Issei said hurriedly. You said you wanted to come back to advancing in rank. Actually, yes. Newly reincarnated devils start out as low-class devils usually. The exceptionally powerful might start out as middle class, although even that is very rare. Eventually, all of you will qualify to test for middle class devils, it's my goal to have all of you in the middle class within the next five years. So much for the seniority system, Kiryu commented. Tsona gave her a mildly exasperated look. That's enough for the moment, please. Kiryu lapsed back into silence, looking slightly chastened. It was an oddly appealing look on her, and once again Issei mentally smacked himself. Tsona was continuing. That said, Kiryu-sen isn't necessarily wrong. There's an advantage to that, too, though, it means that exceptional devils can be rewarded for their achievements, instead of being stuck in a holding pattern. The middle-class examinations are threefold. An essay on themes of aim and greed, an exam on underworld government and history, and one-on-one -on -one combat. The testing is required, although once given, the permission to test lasts indefinitely. There are also examples of portions of the testing being waived because of exceptional deeds. She took a sip of her coffee before continuing. Qualifying for middle class doesn't offer much in the way of perks, granted. But it's a solid indicator of your increased power and status in devil society, and many instructors in advanced techniques or magics won't teach someone who hasn't made middle class at least. And you said that once we make high class, we can form our own peerages. Does that make us devil nobility, then? Murayama asked curiously. Unofficially, at least. The true nobility are the members of the 72 pillars, the original devil houses, Sona said. Pure breed devils frequently harbor prejudice towards the reincarnated, but by the time one reaches high class, they've demonstrated themselves someone not to take lightly. She paused, catching Issei's eye. I'll come back to peerages again at a later time, when more of you are closer to qualifying for one. Issei nodded slowly, his cheeks pinking slightly. Both of them knew he was remembering the conversation they'd had about them the prior night. I'd like to talk a little about peerages. More specifically, about yours, when you have one, Sona had said quietly. He'd taken the mutation rook pee several minutes before, and they had resumed lying on the bed in each other's arms. They were between kisses, and from the way they were lazily touching each other, the next one probably wasn't far off. He had blinked at the apparent non-sequitur. Now I know that's a ways off. Don't underestimate yourself, she'd said, a faint note of exasperation entering her voice. Didn't I just tell you that the mutation piece marks you as special? So does the sacred gear you have. And you're you. That makes you special. 
She had blushed as she said that last part and cleared her throat as if to reassert her rationality. I'm certain you'll advance quickly. Especially if you have patronage. Issei had shifted around to give her another surprised look. Like your sister. Kusaka said that she's high up in the devil government. Yes, she is. Sona's smile had been a little wry. Issei had long since learned that was her preferred style of humor and thought it suited her perfectly. You'll be meeting her soon, if I know her. She had seemed a touch embarrassed about her sister. Kusaka said she's an eccentric. But if she's anything like Sona, I'm sure I like her, Issei mused. Possibly her, yes, his fiance had continued. Or some of her colleagues, whose work is actually similar to yours. You'll have a chance to meet them soon, too. But we're wandering off topic. Her eyes had shifted back towards Issei and peered at him intently. Peerages can take many different forms. Circles of friends, surrogate families harems. Issei had flushed and squirmed. That was a word that hadn't come out of his mouth for most of a school year. Really, it had half regressed into subconscious fantasy at this point. Sona Chan, if it's a choice between you and that, you'll win every time. You do know that, right? He had been absolutely sincere. So was the oh god am I dreaming please tell me I'm not hope he was trying and failing to suppress. I know, Issei Kun. His shoulders had slumped in relief at a reassuring, level tone. But I'm not asking you to choose. In fact, I'm quite willing to let you have one, provided you follow some basic guidelines. His eyes had widened again and flicked around the bedroom, as if looking for eavesdroppers or a studio audience. I promise, no hidden cameras, she'd said dryly. Issei had chuckled awkwardly. I'll take your word on that he'd cleared his throat. That's reasonable. You, ah, you sound like you've been thinking about this a while. I've had time to consider this. Sona's voice had been faintly amused. Harems are common in devil society. Sometimes, it's even female devils with harems of beautiful men, though those are rather less common. But yes, this is something I was thinking about even before I came to Kuo. The first requirement is that the women have to be people both of us can like and respect. I refuse to share you with a bimbo or someone like that fallen angel, and I don't think you'd want someone like that, anyway. You're right, Issei had told her, shuddering at the thought of someone like Rainer. And while he'd met many a gorgeous airhead, the thought of having to try to hold a conversation with one made him grimace. What are the others? There's one more. You have to take responsibility for them. Take responsibility for does devil society allow for that? Issei had said in pleased surprise. Sona had nodded. Polygamy is legal and accepted under devil law, although polygyny is the more common form by far. Male high-class devils frequently have several junior wives in addition to the primary wife. She gave him a playfully old-fashioned look, one that actually made him tremble in mild arousal. I'm not relinquishing that position, though. Issei had blinked, considering that in trying not to think with his lower head. His answer had been inevitable, though. Not like you really thought it would come up in the near future, though I think I can live with that. You're not asking anything unreasonable. He dropped the back of his head, grinning self-effacingly. I'm pretty sure it's not gonna be relevant anytime soon, though. Sona had given her fiancé a fond, knowing smile. Not for the first time, Issei had the feeling that she knew something he didn't. But, again, he hadn't gotten the suspicion that something malicious was being withheld. In fact, it had felt more like she'd bought a surprise birthday gift she just knew he was going to love. You might be surprised, she had said dryly, and then resumed kissing him. Think that covers most of the basics. Issei realized, with a start, that Sona was wrapping up her spiel. She paused long enough to give him another faint smile, as if she'd known exactly what he was mulling over. Honestly, he wasn't prepared to believe she wasn't capable of reading minds. Her attention shifted back to Kiryu and Murayama. Are you two ready? The two girls exchanged glances and nodded. Kiryu spoke first. Let's do it. Very well. We'll start with you, Kiryu-san. Sona looked at Tsubaki, who pulled a cushion off the couch and settled it on the floor in front of her. Lay down, please, and rest your head on the pillow. I didn't get a pillow last night, Issei joked. That's because I was virtually sitting in your lap, Sona replied with a dry laugh. Saji grumbled softly to himself, while Murayama suddenly found the window fascinating. Kiryu chuckled and did as Sona asked, lying down and closing her eyes. Sona placed a pawn piece on her chest. When nothing happened, she added a second and then a third. That finally pulled the trigger and the pieces began to glow and sink into her chest. As they did, Sona began to recite the same chant she'd used for Issei. Arise. I bid you, cast off the mortal stuff of man, and don the infernal skin of a devil. I bind you, body and soul, to my heart and service. Arise, Kiryuika, pawn of three and service to the house of Sitri. The glow faded as the pieces fully merged with Kiryu, and she sat up, rubbing the back of her head. Welcome to my peerage, Kiryu-san, Sona said. 
Issei heard the warmth in her voice, the genuine pleasure at welcoming someone else to her pseudo family. Ha. Hey. Thanks, Kaichu, Kiryu said, smiling. Whoa. She scooted away from the pillow and waved Murayama over. Come on, Murayama chan. I don't feel any different. That doesn't actually reassure me, you know, Murayama shot back dryly. She crawled over and laid her head down on the cushion, though, closing her eyes and folding her hands on her stomach. There was something almost tranquil about her as she did that, and Issei had trouble tearing his eyes away. Tsona placed her remaining night piece on Murayama's chest, and this time it started merging without trouble. Sona repeated the same recitation that she'd used with Kiryu, only replacing the new pawn's name with Murayama's, and the pawn with night. A moment after the glow faded, Murayama sat up, patting herself down as if looking for obvious changes. There won't be any obvious physical changes, except for the wings, Sona told them. The two girls looked at her sharply. We get wings. They chorused in pleased surprise and turned their eyes towards Issei. He held up his hands. Hey, I didn't know either. Yes, all of you get wings. Sona said, sounding amused. And that's that for today, Issei declared, closing and locking the front door. It had been a long, busy day, capped off by an experimental flight by the entire peerage around Kuo's environs. She'd been surprised at how pleased Aika and Kaori were to be able to fly. Issei had been, too, although his flying had been somewhat more awkward. It was almost as if he had learned to fly a different way and was having to unlearn old habits. Issei and Sona were the only ones left in Sona's apartment now. The cleaning was done, and the remainder of the night was for the two of them, something Sona had made a point of arranging. Yes, it is. Have a seat. Sona patted the spot on the couch next to her. Issei complied with a soft smile. He was quite handsome when he smiled like that, Sona thought. She was pleased that it was hers alone, for the time being. She smiled back, scooting closer and leaning her head against his shoulder. Her right hand shot out, taking hold of his left hand and squeezing it. As a daughter of the House of Citri, a devil family associated with love and desire, Sona knew all too well the urge to drown oneself in physical affection. She knew that was the reason her sister was so tactile, and she also knew that was why she had taken such care to cultivate a stern demeanor and chaste reputation. Now that she finally had a say, she was making up for lost time and trying to keep herself from running too amok. She probably could be trying harder, but she didn't much care to. It was customary for devil couples who were betrothed to act like spouses in all but name, as long as pregnancy didn't happen before the exchange of vows. Ria's and Riser were the exception, and Sona joined her friend in hoping that he somehow got himself eaten by Great Red or something. I never thought I'd like holding hands so much, he said softly. Neither had I, Sona replied, half closing her eyes as she leaned against him. It's still okay for you to stay the night. Yeah, Issei said with a laugh. I almost think Tusan and Kasan like you better than me. I prefer to think of it as them welcoming me to the family, she replied archly, and that made both of them snicker. His parents really were being amazing accommodating about them staying the night with each other. That made Sona even more determined to stay on their good side. After a few minutes of companionable silence, he asked, was there something besides the snuggling? Because I'm good with that, but... No, I suppose we should get that out of the way, Sona sighed and sat up. Her hand was still gripping his, though. I'd like to talk about your advancement in rank. He looked at her quizzically. It's only been 24 hours or do you mean talking about how to speed it up? That and how it affects when you and I can actually marry, Sona corrected. If we have to wait until I make high class, it might be a while, Issei mused, looking slightly guilty. Don't underestimate yourself, Sona told him. Issei tended to be self-effacing, particularly when operating outside his field of expertise. In many ways, that was an admirable trait. It also meant, however, that his ability to accurately gauge his self-worth was untrustworthy. In devil society, especially at low rank, that could be deadly. Building him up was an ongoing process. Middle class would probably be sufficient, although my parents would probably be happier if you made high class first. How long does it usually take? Issei asked. The time frame I quoted everyone is typical, although it's on the efficient side of typical, she replied. I have reason to believe, however, that circumstances will speed things along. At Issei's questioning look, she added, because of what happened with that fallen angel that assaulted you, I suspect that we may be entering a new period of conflict. Issei looked slightly apprehensive. That doesn't sound good. It's not, Sona agreed. But it does have advantages. Even humans have sayings about promotions coming quickly during wartime. Between that and your work on the app and what might stem from that, I suspect you'll make middle class by the time you graduate. Maybe before. The rest of the peerage won't be far behind, if at all. That's less than 18 months away, Issei said slowly, looking surprised. I've been known to be wrong, Sona admitted. But I don't think I'm that far off. 
All right, I'll trust you, her fiancé said. His smile turned resolute. I'll do my best for you, Sona-chan, you and everyone else. I'll make you proud. I know you will, Sona assured him, and meant it. He was smart and resourceful and kind. Between the rook piece and his sacred gear, she was certain he'd do well. She kissed him again, this one had the full weight of her desire behind it. Let's go to bed. Sunday. That's a good start, Haidu kun Yura said cheerily. No it's not Asay panted, flopping on the grass. He had spent the entire morning being pushed around the field by the other rook. He had managed to block most of her strikes, but that still meant he had spent hours stumbling backwards like an idiot. Although his arms and legs ached way less than he had been expecting. Murayama was adapting to being a knight much better, she was genuinely trading blows with Meguri as they sparred. He sat up as he caught his breath and smiled wryly. And you can call me Ice if you want, since we're teammates and all now. Rook Solidarity, right? Rook Solidarity, Yura agreed with a grin, sitting next to him. And it's Tsubasa then. She wore blue jeans and a grey t-shirt today, her hair clubbed back into a stubby ponytail. It was a cute look, and Issei wasn't sure what to do with that thought after Friday's conversation with Sona. Anyway, when you consider that you've been a programmer first and foremost, you're doing well. Don't beat yourself up too badly. That's what the training is for, she added with a wink. Indeed. Both of them looked up as Sona approached. T-shirts and jeans seemed to be the uniform of the day, and she was no exception. Although she seemed to have pilfered one of his shirts again, this time his blue if coating, headphones focused t-shirt. It wasn't something he could bring himself to get mad about. And, like Tsubasa, Sona wore them well. Tsubasa is here to show you the ropes, Issei Kun. Everyone starts from square one, so no self recrimination. You know me too well, Sona see ah, Sona san, Issei said, rubbing the back of his head. He's doing decently at blocking attacks, Tsubasa reported. It'll just take practice to develop the rest. I'm a little surprised you're not dragging me to a dojo for this, Issei commented curiously. Or putting me in a guy. Oh, I have that in mind eventually, Tsubasa told him. But I think, and Kaichu agreed, that we need to get you up to speed as fast as possible, so right now we're going Krav Maga, which means you're learning moves picked for pure effectiveness. She indicated his clothes. And I think it's best to learn to fight when wearing what you're likeliest to end up fighting in. Stray devils won't wait for you to change into a guy, after all. She beeped her head, looking at Issei. How do the afternoons work for you, for training? Issei started to answer, but Sona held up a hand. That should be fine, Tsubasa. I'd like to talk to Murayama Sen about something first, though. She waved the Kendoka over. Murayama trotted over, Shinai still in hand. Kaichu. She nodded at Issei and you know, I guess it's Tsubasa san, now, Issei mused. Because of that musing, he missed the faint reddening of Murayama's face as she glanced at Issei, although neither Tsubasa nor Sona missed it. Mura actually, I like to encourage a certain degree of informality among my peerage. Are you alright with being called Kaori? Sona asked. Sure, I guess, Murayama said. She looked more than a little ambivalent about it, though. Hey Ori, I think there'd be value to you and Issei Kun training against each other, since it's not uncommon for knights and rooks to encounter each other during raiding games, Sona explained. Murayama nodded. Sure, we can do that now, if Haidu and Yura are done sparring. Yes, but I was thinking on a more regular basis, the king said. Something in her tone snagged Issei's attention, and clearly did the same for Murayama. Wait, do I call her Kaori now, too? The new rook wondered. That's an awkward question to ask she drew a deep breath and continued, I'd like Issei Kun to join the kendo club. I don't think that's a good idea, Murayama said, at the same time that Issei blurted out, that'll get me killed. The two of them exchanged looks, clearly surprised to be expressing the same basic idea. Issei gave her a go-ahead gesture, and Murayama spoke next. Kaichu a lot of the girls who refuse to believe Haidu's changed are in the kendo club. He's not wrong well, he can probably survive them deciding to make a moving target out of him now, but they're not going to be happy about him joining. You believe he's changed, don't you? Sona said, arching an eyebrow. Well, yeah. Mireyama's tone attached an unspoken dud to the end of the sentence. But you didn't see the reactions to his idiot friend's rumor on Friday. Your announcement about ignoring rumors helps some, but there's still a lot of people who can't or won't believe Haidu's cleaned up his act. I know my best friend's one of them. See, Sona-san, it's probably not a good idea, Issei pointed out. And asking Murayama to vouch for me would probably get her in trouble with the other girls. Let's not do that to her. Sparring after school would probably be enough part of him was feeling oddly happy to hear that Murayama believed he changed. Making that part of him shut up was more difficult than usual. Sona considered that. What if I talk to Yagashi-san directly, then? That'll leave you out of the official equation, Kaori. If necessary, you can volunteer to be his minder during club activities. 
I guess that would work, Murayama admitted. That might give them time to see he's changed, if I'm acting as a buffer she looked at his say, and he couldn't read her expression. You good with that? Yeah, if you're sure about it, he replied. Ah, who's thirsty? I'm thirsty. If you're offering, I'll take one of the bottled waters, Sona said. I'd like to talk to them about training schedules. One of the lime energy drinks or bottled water if that's out, Tsubasa chimed in. Kaori. Um. Um, an energy drink is fine, Kaori said. I'll be right back, then, Issei told them, and he jogged over to the bench where Tsubasa had set the drinks cooler. He fished out two bottled waters and two lime energy drinks, trying not to watch Sona's conversation curiously. After a minute or two, he trotted back over to the three girls, carefully balancing the stack of drinks. Thank you, Issei-kun. Sona accepted her drink gratefully and then squeezed his hand after he finished distributing the rest. Even that small gesture of affection, in front of the rest of the peerage, made his face flush. So it looks like we have a lesson plan in mind, Tsubasa said cheerily. You and I work on your hand-to-hand -hand every afternoon you don't have kendo club. This includes weekends, although Kaichu is pretty adamant about leaving your mornings untouched. Can't imagine why, she added with a wink. Tsubasa, you needn't editorialize, thank you, Sona said dryly. Yes, Kaichu. The blue-haired rook didn't sound all that contrite. I think I'm gonna make sure Tomo doesn't forget how to defend against an empty hand. Ice-chan, why don't you and Kaori go head-to-head? -head? She patted her fellow rook on the shoulder and headed off. Ice-chan I never said that was Issei threw up his hands in exasperation. See, Issei-kun. You're getting along with the rest of the peerage already Issei looked at Sona, amazed and amused at her playful teasing tone. Mireyama was clearly thunderstruck. Hey, yeah, I guess so there really wasn't much else he could say to that. He turned back towards Mireyama. We can try sparring now, if you if like, Mireyama. Sure, the Kendoka said. You can call me Kaori too, I guess. Teammates and all, right? Right, Mura Kaori-san. Call me Ice then. Issei darted a quick questioning look at Sona, who just nodded. He felt such a weird profound mix of embarrassment and happiness that he actually started looking forward to the sparring. At least having something to hit would burn off this energy in a less embarrassing way wait. Not Ice-chan though. Murayama considered that, then smirked. That depends on how well you can block. Oh, ring it. Issei shot back, a smirk of his own rising in reply. This kind of banter felt safer than contemplating how cute a lively Murayama was. Let's see how long your shinai lasts before I snap it in half. Welp. Issei stared down at the snapped shinai in his hands. Or rather, the mass of splintered and shattered wood that had been a shinai. Yep. Murayama stared at the mass of bruises she'd left along his arms and shoulders, under the shredded remains of his t-shirt. They were healing way faster than a normal human's wounds would, but still. Truce. He said. Truce, she agreed readily, then added, ice. He slumped in relief. Jan. Oh, we're going again, then. What did I miss? Tsubasa asked as she walked up. The Ruck and a knight cancelling each other's advantages out, Sona remarked, watching them with an odd kind of satisfaction. And it took them how long? About 30 seconds. Hmm. Tsubasa's expression became mischievous, and she called out, don't go easy on him this time, Kaori. You're next, Basa-chan. Issei called out. If it were possible for someone to sound simultaneously nettled and amused, his voice would be the textbook example. Tsubasa didn't look dismayed at the familiar nickname. In fact, she looked almost delighted. If you think that'll throw me off my game, you're dreaming. Sona shook her head in amusement as she watched the byplay. Issei seemed to be fitting in nicely. So far, so good. Monday. Hey, I had a thought, Issei said, his tone a little bashful. The two of them were standing in his room, getting ready to leave for school. Sona looked at him as she settled the half cape around her shoulders. What is it? Well since I don't have a ring to give you, at least not yet, I'd kinda like to give you something to show that we're, you know, together. To show it in public. His cheeks were cherry red. Sona's expression softened. Issei Kun, that's sweet. What did you have in mind? Well Issei grabbed his uniform blazer off the chair it was draped over and settled it around her shoulders. I know it's a little silly. She fingered the blazer's lapel, biting her lip as she considered it. Dot I do like the idea. But that puts your uniform out of kilter for school regs, and... Yeah, I guess it does, he admitted, pulling it off her shoulders and putting it on instead. And there's the other thing. Yes. Sona made a mouth of irritation. Seeing her pout was incredibly cute and he suspected it would be incredibly unwise to point that out. I do want the two of us to go public, Issei-kun. I really do. But right now, after what your friends did on Friday. Yeah. They really did a number on us. Issei could strangle Mitsuda and Motohama right now. It's okay, Sona-chan. I can wait as long as we need to. I'm good with that. 
he was mostly telling the truth. Tsona gave him a searching look, and he was sure she knew what he was thinking. She reached out, squeezing his hand. Let's try dinner again on Thursday. A date night. There's nothing stopping us from being on a date in public. I'll take it. Issei smiled and squeezed back. Hi do. Issei looked up at the sound of his name and groaned inwardly as he saw the speaker approach. The man Agawa Kauki was generally considered the perfect man of the high school division's third year. He was handsome, gifted both academically and athletically, charismatic, and genuinely devoted to justice. Those traits tended to overshadow the fact that he was also incredibly self-righteous and naive and tended to equate the majority opinion with right. And, since he had always been popular, his idea of right always matched the majority opinion. He was the kind of person who would tell a bullying victim that they'd brought it upon themselves for being weird. It was true that he'd never do so to be mean. Even Issei had to admit that he was free of conscious malice. But his conviction that the majority opinion was always right would always dishearten the victim further, and all too many of his hangers-on were assholes who would grind down the victim when Amanagawa wasn't looking. Around him were a half-dozen other third-year students, most of them cool kids who would parrot whatever he said. The only one that didn't apply to was Higashi Shizuku, the kendo club captain, who was usually trying, and failing, to ride hurt on her childhood friend. It seemed like a thankless job to say. It looked like Amanagawa had heard about the rumor and had drank the funking Kool-Aid. This was not going to be pleasant. It was probably just as well that Sona had gone in early this morning. Can I help you, senpai? Issei asked resignedly. I want to know what you think you're doing with those girls on the student council, Amanagawa said, jutting his chin out. He probably thought he was looking resolute and heroic. Personally, Issei though he looked like a dumbass, but he was probably in the minority. Programming their computers, senpai, he said. Amanagawa scowled, clearly seeing himself as the hero of justice cowing the villain into submission. I don't like the rumors I've been hearing about you lately, Haidu. They're just rumors, senpai, Issei insisted. It was probably a lost cause, but Sona would be angry if he decked Amanagawa. I believe the council issued a notice about ignoring malicious rumors on Friday. Even so, Amanagawa said. With your reputation, I'm afraid I have to take those rumors seriously. The source is my idiot friends, and you're still taking it seriously. Issei couldn't contain his exasperation at that. It doesn't matter what the source is, Amanagawa said patiently, as if speaking to a small child. Your reputation is the problem. I just can't accept your word that nothing's happening. So ask Sona Kaichu or someone else on the council, Issei replied, his voice tight with leashed annoyance. Can I go now? He turned to leave, but jerked to a stop as Amanagawa grabbed his arm. What? I want you to resign from your council position and never talk with any of those girls again, Amanagawa said with complete seriousness. That's the only way I'll know for sure you're not doing anything to them. Haki-kun, Yagashi said, exasperated. It's the only way, Shizuku, Amanagawa said, and again, his tone was like a teacher lecturing an especially slow student. If he wants to demonstrate he's turning over a new leaf, the burden's on him. You wouldn't believe me, anyway, Issei said snippily. You're being pretty insulting to Yagashi senpai, too. That's your problem, not mine, Amanagawa said, his tone blithe with lack of sympathy for Issei's situation. Like I said, the burden's on you to change our minds. If it's an uphill climb for you, well, no one said we had to make it easy. He didn't even acknowledge his treatment of Shizuku, Issei's comment about it seemed to have flown right over his head. You don't get to dictate terms to me, senpai, Issei said, his tone ever tighter now. And the answer is no. He shook off Amanagawa's arm and started to walk away again. Amanagawa grabbed his arm again, yanking him back. Haki-kun. Yagashi snapped. She grabbed Amanagawa's wist and pried his fingers free of Issei's arm. Haidu-kun, why don't you? Take your hand off my arm, senpai, Issei said in a quiet voice, his entire body taut. The hand of his free arm clenched into a fist, a sign that Yagashi and several other onlookers caught. Amanagawa, predictably, did not catch it. Don't blow me off, Haidu. He declared, clearly expecting the sheer force of his moral authority to overpower Issei. I'll go to the principal, I'll have you expelled. Those poor girls won't have to put up with you a minute longer then. All right, that's enough. Sona stepped in. Issei hadn't even seen her appear, and from the looks on the faces around him, apparently neither had anyone else. She speared Amanagawa with a harsh look. You'll back off now, Amanagawa san. Her tone was level, but cool. But Sona san. Amanagawa looked back and forth between Issei and Sona. The idea that she wasn't treating Issei like dirt was something that he couldn't begin to process. How can you defend him? He's obviously a... Issei-kun has repeatedly proven himself to my satisfaction and that of the rest of the council, Sona said, emphasizing his name, and her tone abruptly plummeted from cool to frigid. 
her gaze sharpened, regarding Amanagawa with naked contempt. Or do you think we're such helpless damsels that we need you to safeguard us? Amanagawa paled, stumbling over his words. The implication was clear. He really did think just that. The idea that the girls on the student council might be able to take care of themselves hadn't even occurred to him. Even now, he was clearly having trouble parsing Sona's words. Sona sniffed dismissively and turned back towards Issei. Issei-kun, what we talked about earlier. Are you sure? Issei said softly. He wanted to do it, but he didn't want to Sona to agree to do it in a fit of pique. I am, she told him, the faintest of smiles crossing her lips as she looked him in the eye. I promise. You've convinced me. Whatever you want, Sona-san, he answered, doffing his uniform jacket. He settled it around her shoulders like a faux cape and took a minute to admire how she looked. I like it. So do I, Sona agreed and looked unflinchingly at Amanagawa and his hangers-on. When she spoke, the declaration might as well have come echoing down from the sky. Issei-kun is my fiancé, Amanagawa-san. I'll thank you not to hassle him. And here we go, Issei thought wryly as he saw Amanagawa verge on apoplexy. His followers were stunned into silence. Only Agashi had retained her composure. In fact, he could swear she was unsurprised, maybe even approving. The cad was, well and truly, out of the bag. But if that was what it took to hold hands with Sona Citri and public run, kitty, run. Shall we, Sona-san? He said, politely indicating the doorway. He offered his hand to her. Let's, Sona agreed, inclining her head in thanks. She took his hand, interlacing her fingers with his, and they entered the main building with their heads held high. The grapevine went berserk. You've been holding out on us, Ice. Mitsuda complained as the newly engaged Rook sat down. Are you really surprised, after Friday? Issei retorted. His voice was calm, but it was a brittle kind of calm, and testiness wasn't very far beneath the surface. We wouldn't have done that if you told us you were tapping the kaiju, Motohama said, as if that were an obvious conclusion. Okay, man, that's just don't talk like that about Sona ch Sona san, Issei said. His calm was showing cracks now, and he was vaguely aware of Kusaka, Kiryu, and Murayama watching him with quiet concern. No, they're Ryasan, Ikasan, and Kaori san now, a part of his mind reminded him. Whatever, man, Mitsuda said dismissively. I don't really get the appeal, though. She's boring. A real cold librarian type, isn't she? She's not. Issei's tone was clearly frayed now. Unnoticed by him, Kaori and Ria had both subtly tensed to move in case something happened. Caddis did notice this, but was perplexed by it. And I told you, don't talk like that about her. Or what? The two teenagers said pugnaciously. Or I'll toss you two out the window. There was more irritation than calm in Issei's voice now. His fingers were suddenly white-knuckled on the desk's edges. Itsuda laughed, either oblivious towards or disbelieving of Issei's body language. I'd like to see you try. Okay, that's enough, Ria interjected quickly, her voice atypically loud and sharp. What the hell is wrong with you two? She snorted in annoyance. Really? Aika added, shaking her head. Real friends would be happy he'd found a girl. A real friend wouldn't get a girlfriend while his buds are still flying solo. Mitsuda shot back. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, Ria said, her tone withering. And I was here Friday when you two confessed to starting that rumor. You two stay out of this, Motohama protested. What do you care, anyway? We care because you two won't frigging shut up about it, Aika replied scornfully. It's stupid. What, you expect him to dump the kaiju just to make you two feel better? Yes. Mitsuda and Motohama chorused, absolutely no irony in their expressions. Issei rolled his eyes heavenward and spread his hands in exasperation. Yeah, that ain't happening, he replied in a snippy tone. And believe they actually expected it to, Ria said dryly, and she shook her head as well. What's it matter to you two? Mitsuda demanded. They're just tired of seeing you give him static when he's trying to clean up his act, Kaori interjected, and she sounded just as annoyed as the other two girls. So am I. It's getting annoying. Kaori, you don't actually believe it, do you? Caddis asked incredulously. Where's the harm in taking the chance? The brunette countered with a shrug. We can always go back to beating on him later if he turns out to be faking. Caddis looked like she wanted to debate that, but couldn't. She still gave Issei a distrustful look. Neither she, nor the perverted duo, noticed the grateful looks Issei gave his new peerage mates, or the encouraging smiles they gave him in return. Certainly. I'll get the paperwork taken care of before lunch. The next club meeting will be this afternoon. Shizuku looked at Issei. Will you be able to join us today, Haidu-kun? Yes, senpai I mean, but you, Issei said immediately. Shizuku nodded, and then her eyes sharpened slightly. Both Sona-san and Murayama-san vouch for you. I'm inclined to take them at their shared word, but I still want to make sure that you understand the ramifications. 
I do, but you, Issei said, his gaze level. I live up to their trust. Then there should be no problem, the kendo club captain said with a nod. She then paused, looking slightly uncomfortable. I'd also like to talk to you about Ko about Amanagawa-kun. It was Issei's turn to give Shizuku a sharp look. What about him? I'm not gonna apologize. I didn't do anything. No. I was there, and I agree, Shizuku said, and her discomfort became even more apparent. I wish I could say that he'd sent an apology with me. So, I suppose I'm apologizing on his behalf. Um, thanks, I guess, Issei said, looking guilty himself. I don't blame you, but you. I'm glad to hear that, Shizuku told him. It's no excuse, but he's still hurting from what happened with Shirasaki-san. Well, Shirasaki-senpai and Nagumo-senpai were friends of mine too, but I'm not taking it out on other people, Issei replied. His response came out more sharply than he'd intended, judging from his expression, and he immediately apologized. Shizuku raised a hand. It's all right. Now, I'm sorry, but can I have a private word with Shitori-san? Issei glanced at Sona, who nodded. Sure. I'll talk to Kaori-san about equipment, I guess. He glanced between the two girls and left the room. What is it? Sona asked. I'm going to advise you right now. Kyoto is interested in your relationship with Haidu-kun. They'll take an ill view of him coming to harm while in your service or as a result of your romance. I think you should keep that in mind at all times. Is that the official word of the Kyoto faction observer in Kuo? Sona asked. Her expression was one of mild surprise. Shizuku shook her head. For now, just consider it a friendly suggestion. The Hyatus have friends in Kyoto. There's a vested interest in seeing nothing happen to their son. And that makes me curious, Sona said, her eyes narrowing slightly. Issei Kun and I had breakfast with them Saturday, and I concentrated on them for the first time. They're not typical humans she trailed off, the unspoken question clear. I'm not really at liberty to elaborate, Shizuku said, apparently unmoved by Sona's curiosity. As long as Haidu Kun is treated well, there'll be no problems. I have every intention of treating him well, Yugashi san. He's my fiancé, and I love him. But I appreciate the heads up. Then things should be fine, Shizuku told her. I'll file the paperwork for Haidu Kun, then. She rose to leave. Wait. One thing, Sona said unexpectedly, causing the yaokai to look at her in surprise. Do you know anything about Grigori declaring open season on sacred gear bearers? No. Shizuku looked perplexed at the thought. I'd think that exceptionally uncharacteristic of Azazel. He's a tinkerer and a scientist these days. She made him out as she was thinking. It'd be pretty stupid of him, too. That would just drive any prospective recruit away from Grigori, and given how heavily they rely on the disaffected for manpower, her eyes sharpened. You're suspecting a schism, aren't you? I hope not, Sona said. But that fallen angel who attacked Issei Kuan seemed pretty certain she had official coverage. So, either she's simply that stupid, or someone with authority actually issued her orders. Or both, she didn't say aloud. That girl Rainer, Issei and Ria had said she called herself, seemed to believe herself literally bulletproof. That kind of thinking didn't necessarily require justification. I'll pass your thoughts on to Yasaka Dono, Shizuku told her. If that'll be all. Ah forgive me, but I'm curious. I don't suppose there's been any news on the incident from your class trip, Sona asked carefully. She felt guilty for even bringing it up. Shizuku shook her head. Pain flashed briefly through her eyes. None. But thank you for asking. The disappearance of half of Class 3C while on a class trip to Fukuoka, including Shizuku's best friend Shirasaki Kaori and her boyfriend Nagumo Hajim, had hung like a dark cloud over their classmates in the month since it had happened. The lack of conclusive answers didn't help. Please let me know if there's any way we can help, Sona added. She meant it, too, and not just because that would mean the Kyoto faction observer owed her a marker. Thank you. The observer cleared her throat, then repeated with polite pointedness, if that'll be all. Yes, I think so. Thank you, Yugashi-san. This is getting really old, really quick, Issei said as yet another group of girls glowered at him as he passed. He was trying to sound philosophical about it, but it was clear his patience was starting to fray. I know, Kaori said commiseratingly. I could understand being skeptical about me, he continued as they walked towards the kendo club room. That's fair. But that shoulder applied to those idiots, too. Why do they get a pass? People don't like change, I suppose, the kendoka answered. Especially not when it means they have to take a look at themselves. If someone they dislike takes steps to improve themselves, it means they start looking bad, and that just won't do the words were philosophical, if snarky. Her tone was actually, genuinely annoyed on Issei's behalf, and he gave the newly minted knight a surprised look. Don't get me wrong, she said quickly. I'm just disgusted at the hypocrisy. You do believe me, right? Issei said carefully. 
It felt really important to him that Kaori believed that he was cleaning up his act. He was afraid to probe any closer at just why. Of course I do, she said quickly. I've spent enough time with you the past few days. You're not like those idiots. At least, not anymore. He nodded his thanks, trying to ignore the sense of relief he felt at her words. That relief lasted until they passed the next group of students to give him withering looks. Once they were in a deserted stretch of hallway, he let out a tart laugh. Maybe I should lean into this. If they're gonna act like I'm a monster, I should start busting heads. He stumbled to a stop at her sharp look. I'm kidding, Kaori-san. Well mostly. I hope so, she said, her expression still stern. Ice one thing about you that always stood out is that you were kind. Kinder than your friends. Even when your inner horndog was in control she sighed. I can't blame you for being frustrated. Between those idiot friends of yours and a Managawa senpai going all self-righteous, it's understandable. She looked him in the eye, her expression softening. You're better than them. They're not worth you sinking to their level. Keep being kind. I gotcha. Thanks, Kaori-san. She just nodded. She looked like she'd been quietly arguing with herself about something. But all she said was, if we hurry, we can get your gear while the room's mostly empty. Let's go. What is he doing here? The say bowed. There was a certain order to things, even if it was futile. I'll be working with the kendo club from today forward. I hope we can get along. He paused, then added, I know my past behavior has given many of you a bad opinion of me, and I can't blame you for that. I hope to demonstrate that I've changed. Well put, Haidu kun, Yagashi said. Shitori Kaichu vouches for him, and I'm satisfied with both that and my observation of him. Of course she does, a pigtailed first year student said nastily. Issei couldn't help giving her a sharp look, and she recoiled as if he touched her. No more comments like that, Nagahama, Yagashi cautioned. But. That's final, Nagahama, the kendo club captain said, her tone slightly sharper now. If you don't like it. Kaori raised her hand. But you, I'll work with Haidu if it'll make the others feel better. The soft susurus arose, of mixed relief, oh, thank god, someone else will have to work with Haidu. And guilt, no. Poor Mureyama san Kaori. Kadis protested. You don't have to do that. Are you sure, Murayama? Yagashi asked. Yeah, she answered with a resigned shrug. Maybe he's on the level. If he is, he won't make trouble, and we can just get on with business. Yagashi nodded. Work with him this week, and we'll see about switching things up next week, okay? Okay, the brunette said, and Issei just nodded silently. The club members slowly quieted down and got to practicing, aside from periodic distrustful looks directed towards the club's newest member. Only Yagashi noticed the commiserating half-smiles exchanged between Issei and his mandatory partner as they practiced. Rias waved Sona and her peerage into the orc clubroom. Please, come in. I see you have new members with you. Indeed we do, Sona agreed, nodding her thanks as Akeno started pouring tea. My peerage has been brought up to full membership over the weekend. I'd like to introduce my new recruits, so everyone will be up to speed on who's in the know. Of course, everyone in the room knew who had been reincarnated during the weekend, but there were long-standing traditions about this kind of thing. Go right ahead, Rhea said graciously. Sona glanced at Aika, who cleared her throat and rose. I'm Kiryu Aika, pawn of Sona Citri. I hope we can work well together. She bowed, and Rhea's returned the bow, smiling and welcome. As Aika sat, Kaori stood, looking slightly nervous. I'm Ureyama Kaori, Sona Citri's new knight. It's nice to meet you all as, well, devils, and I hope we can get along. She and Rias bowed to each other, and the latter turned her eyes expectantly toward Sona's new rook. The rest of her peerage did likewise, with varying degrees of subtlety. Issei let out a breath and rose, rubbing the back of his head. Hiya. I'm Haidu Issei, rook of Sona Sona Citri. I look forward to working with you guys. Is that all? Rias asked, her tone lightly teasing. Um she had to use a mutation piece on me, Issei said slowly, giving the Gremory heiress a quizzical look. He vaguely noted the surprise from Kiba and Akeno as they heard that. And? Rias prompted. Issei had to fight the urge to roll his eyes. And so Nakaichu and I are engaged. Issei beat his head, giving Rias a that good enough. Look. She just grinned. We look forward to working with all of you too, Akeno said smoothly. She then paused, and everyone in the room could see what she said next coming. Even if Rias and I aren't your type, Haidu kun. Amid the snickers, not even Sona could resist, Issei sighed. I am never going to live that down, am I? No, Akeno told him sweetly. But it's cute of you to entertain the thought that you might. Rias giggled as well and straightened up, clearing her throat. As you've no doubt guessed, the occult research club is my peerage. Akeno is my queen, Yudo kun my knight, and Kaneko chan my rook. I have a bishop, but he has certain issues that make social interactions nearly impossible. 
She spread her hands in a there you have it gesture. Mine is a small peerage, but we're a family of sorts. So are peerages our allies, then? Kaori asked. In most respects, yes, Sona answered. There are certain things we'll compete for. Undoubtedly, the time will come where we'll face each other in a rating game. But, at least as far as matters in Kuo go, we help each other out. Well put, Sona, Ria's agreed. Why didn't you tell me a Seikun had a sacred gear? Sona said exasperatedly to Ria's. Their peerages had been dismissed, and Issei and Tsubasa had gone to practice hand-to-hand, -hand, with Mireyama deciding to tag along to take on the winner. Her fiancé had hurried them out of the orc clubhouse before anyone else, Red. Akeno could come along to help. I thought you knew, Ria said in honest surprise. She seemed just as amazed as that fallen angel had been that Sona hadn't known. Honestly. I thought that was why you'd been cultivating his friendship. I didn't realize that was the case until last Thursday. She smirked good-naturedly. If it helps, it just confirms to me that you two make a good couple. Everything you've done was motivated by caring about him. Not the cool and calculating Citrieris, just Sona. You seem happier with that than I've ever seen you. Thanks, Sona muttered. After a moment, Ria's asked in an overly casual tone, so. What's it like? What's what like? Sona said, giving her a quizzical look. You know it. Ria's gremory was unaccustomed to blushing, but here she was, doing a credible cherry tomato impression. Ah. For a moment, Sona wanted to retort what, having sex, or having a fiancé who's worth a damn. That kind of snark was unworthy of both of them, though. Well. We haven't gone all the way yet oh, she hated the way that sounded, it made her sound like a simpering TV drama character who thought holding hands was the height of scandal. But what we've done so far has been quite enjoyable. Ria's looked at her expectantly, and Sona rolled her eyes. Finally, her own cheek slightly pink, she muttered, he's good with his mouth. The Citrieris was silently gratified by the sight of Ria's getting even redder. She wouldn't have thought it possible for the other girl's face to turn exactly the same shade as her hair, but it was happening anyway. After a few minutes, Ria's face returned to normal, and she sighed. Sona looked at her again, one eyebrow raised questioningly. I envy you, Ria's told her softly. Even with all the rumors, he seems to be a decent guy. I can't say the same for Riser. If he was anything like Haidu Kun, I might not fight this. But, he's him. Sona felt a spike of guilt for her earlier mental snark. She reached out, awkwardly patting Ria's shoulder. You have time. Time to build a peerage that can take him on. Even if that time gets trimmed down, perhaps I can help. Loaning me members from yours. Ria's looked at her hopefully. If it comes to that. Informal rating games allow for it, you know, Sona reminded her gently. And my newest members will be ready and able to help. Especially a Seikun. His abilities and sacred gear aside, he's a Seikun. There was so much packed into those two words that Sona had trouble articulating, but Ria seemed to understand anyway. Humming from you, that's quite the endorsement, the Gremory era said enviously. I'll hold you to that, then. Tuesday. The Se yawned and stretched. It was now proven fact. He couldn't sleep worth a damn unless Sona was next to him. Sadly, she hadn't been able to stay the night before, and his parents had insisted he spend the evening with them. It was far from unreasonable on their part, considering how accommodating they'd been about her, but it still meant he'd slept lousy. He stifled another yawn as he stepped onto the campus, looking around to see if any of his friends or peerage mates were arriving at the same time. Even Saji might make the walk through the school less lonely then. Excuse me. Issei turned and tried not to stare. His first thought was what's with the cute girl in Milky Spiral 7 cosplay. The girl was indeed a beauty, with long jet black hair styled into twin tails and big turquoise eyes. Her costume and details were perfectly accurate and the best quality he'd ever seen. Even the wand looked like it could actually facilitate magic. There was something about her features, too. He'd never seen her before, but something about her face felt familiar. Um, hi, he said hesitantly. What can I do for you? He was uncomfortably aware of people stopping to look at the two of them. There would probably be rumors about him hooking up with cosplay models now. Can you tell me where the student council office is, please? She smiled, and he could swear there were hearts and sparkles in the background. I need to talk to the council president. Oh. Yeah, sure, I'm headed there myself, so if you'll come with me he gestured to the high school building's main entrance. She nodded enthusiastically and, without warning took his arm. Before he could protest, she said brightly, thank you Haidu Issei-kun. Issei froze and gave her a sharp look. Why do you know my name? You mean so Tan hasn't mentioned me? The girl pouted cutely. She's so cold sometimes. I hope she's warmer with you. So Tan? Issei repeated, then his eyes went wide. Sona-chan. Then would you be her her sister? Ria-san said she was eccentric, he reminded himself. He hadn't banked on wears cosplay as street clothes, though. That's right. 
The girl curtsied and struck the for great justice. Pose from the Milky Spiral 7 opening animation. I'm Sarah Fall Leviathan. But you can call me Sarah Chan. She winked, and again he saw hearts and sparkles for a moment. Now that was a magic trick he'd never expected to actually exist. Ah, um, nice to meet you, Issei said carefully, bowing to her. Ah, if it's all the same to you, I'd feel more comfortable calling you a little more formal after all, this in-law was like a cabinet minister or something. He wasn't exactly marrying into royalty, but close enough. Would Sarah Neeson be okay? Um, that's not as cute, though Sarah Fall said, pouting slightly as she thought. I like the sound of Sarah nee, though. Sure, that works, he agreed quickly. Sarah nee. She nodded in satisfaction, taking his arm again, and looked at him appraisingly. So, you're my new little brother. She stated. You look even better than the snapshots Tsubaki-chan sent me. Thanks, I think, Issei said. He wasn't surprised that she already knew what he looked like. Shall we? She nodded, and they entered the building at a brisk pace. As he'd expected, he was getting side-eyed a lot. I do, you bastard, a second-year Kyoto club member grumbled. How dare you cheat on Sona-sama. I'm not. Issei shot back. Hey. Serafrol exclaimed. I'm his sister-in-law. How dare you cheat on Sona-sama with her sister. Another student complained, glaring at them both. We're not. Issei and Serafrol both protested. The latter looked at her sister's fiancé in exasperation. Has this been going on long? Just this week, he told her as they resumed walking. I don't have a good reputation here. I've been trying to turn things around, but... Serafrol nodded. That's what Tsubaki-chan had told me. I guess it makes sense you'd want to vet your sister's boyfriend, Issei said philosophically. Tsubaki-chan also told me you were smart, she said approvingly. So far, I'm pleased with what I've heard. As long as you love and support Sotan, you'll have my approval. She didn't mention the other side of that coin, Issei mused. He heard it well enough, anyway. She'll always have my love and support, he assured her. He'd have promised that even without the unstated threat. Good. Serafal told him, smiling again. We'll get along just fine then, Ikken. Man, everyone's coming up with nicknames for me lately, Issei complained, but he was smiling as he did. So Tan. Serafal lunged forward and glomped Sona, rubbing her cheek against her sister's. Issei tried not to enjoy the sight too much. I've missed you. Hello, one Isama Sona awkwardly returned her sister's hug, blushing like mad. Now that he had a chance to see them together, he could really see the family resemblance. If he hadn't known better, though, he'd have taken Sona for the elder sister. Guess devil government work takes a toll on you, he thought. I see you've met Issei Kun, then. She looked gratefully at him. Thank you for bringing her here. No problem, he said, rubbing the back of his head. Yep. Ikken brought me here, Serafal confirmed. She grabbed Issei's wrist and pulled him over beside Sona, actually arranging them so that they were holding hands and looked like they were exchanging vows. Look at the two of you together. Let me get some pictures she produced a smartphone in a pink and blue case and started snapping away. So cute. I can't wait to be an aunt. One Isama, please Sona looked like she was about to pass out from embarrassment. What are you doing here? I came to see the two of you, of course. Her older sister said enthusiastically. Oh, and to take Ikken to see Ajuka-chan, so that he can inspect his sacred gear. It's the beginning of the school day, Sona said, her tone slightly frayed and her expression slightly nettled. This, Issei knew, was her equivalent of sputtering and wringing her hands. And a Tuesday. I know what his grades are like, Serafal said with a wave of her hand. And what yours are like, so tan. The two of you can miss a day or two without his deviation value being affected, and I can take you to lunch. Okay, knowing what my DV looks like is a little much, Issei protested. Wait. Who's Ajuka? He's the Mayu in charge of technology and research, the elder Citri sister answered promptly. And I'm afraid it's either today or two weeks from now, so tan. He has some projects he's working on. Mayu Demon King. Issei asked, looking at his fiance. That is how the kanji translates, Sona said with a nod. But we usually use the term Satan. The four mass or four Satans, whichever you prefer are the rulers of devil society. One Isama is one of them. That's right. Serafal confirmed. I'm in charge of foreign relations. That's why I'm called Leviathan. It's a title, not a surname. Issei stared at her for a moment. He hadn't been wrong in his assumption, but he hadn't thought big enough. Um. Wow. Ah, I should probably bow, right? Don't you dare. Serafal actually looked genuinely distressed by the thought. Issei found that somehow endearing. Your family now. And I've never been all that comfortable with bowing and scraping. Okay, Sirani, whatever you like, Issei said quickly. He got a quick flash of surprise and approval from both of them, and shot Sona a smile of his own. Ah I guess we don't have a choice, huh? I can cover for your absence, Issei-kun. 
I wish I could go, but I have committee meetings today Sona shook her head, then looked thoughtful. Wanisama I have a thought. Would you be willing to take along my new pawn and knight, as well, and show them around Lucifer? If Issei Kun has to go to the underworld, he should probably get a quick tour, and if I can do the same for my other new pieces. Sure. The more the merrier, Seraphol said brightly, and Issei could tell she meant it. She seemed to be just that kind of person. She's not that much like Sona-chan, at least on the surface. But she's definitely kind. I think I like having an older sister, he thought. I'll wait for them, then. Issei turned toward Seraphol. As he did, Sona picked up the phone on her desk. Um, do I need to bring anything? Change of clothes, a waiver. Dust you, the elder Citri sister told him, smirking slightly at the last word. Ajuka-chan will have everything else there. They're on their way. Sona said, replacing the receiver. She paused, then pulled open a desk drawer and handled Issei a black credit card emblazoned with what he'd come to recognize as the house of Citri sigil. I'll cover lunch, so tan, Seraphol protested. This is in case they need to stay the night, Wanisama. Sona blushed slightly. Be sure to contact me with details. And I want you to bring me back something from the deli near the government district. Ah. I know exactly what you want. Seraphol grinned at Issei. And you will soon, too. Well, I'm sure you've learned some things already she added in a teasing tone. Serani. Issei protested, at the same time that Sona actually sputtered, Wanisama. An adorable brother and sister to dote on. My day no, my week has been made. Seraphol said, her grin turning sentimental. The trip to Lucifer, the devil capital, had been rather surreal for Issei. And that, oddly enough, was because of how normal the whole thing had been thus far. Crossing the dimensional borders had been done in the comfort of a train car, the fact that the Gremory and Citri houses shared a private train car was somehow the least surprising thing of the day. And what he'd seen of devil territory primarily the Gremory lands, as Seraphol had mentioned was so much like Japan that he couldn't tell the difference. Even Lucifer itself was almost indistinguishable from major cities in the human world. He was almost disappointed at the lack of basalt towers and burning lakes. Almost. Even Ajuka Beelzebub himself was remarkable in his unremarkable appearance. If not for his Mayu's robes and the weird stuff in his laboratory, Issei would have taken him for a fellow programmer. Although he had to admit a little jealousy about the other man's looks. The way Ajuka kept glancing at his machine was very familiar, it was an expression he saw in the mirror daily. Here. Ajuka handed Seraphil a small case, about the size and shape of a portable toiletries bag. It's a prototype portable sacred gear scanner. It's connected to the database we have here. I imagine your and Serzich's sisters can get some good use out of it, and I'll get feedback on how well it works. How's it connected to the database here? Issei asked interestedly. I'll let you take a look at our electronic setup here sometime, so you can see, Ajuka said, perking up at Issei's question. Technology geeks really were the same, whether they were humans or devils. In return, I'd like to take a look at what you have on your devil summoning app. Definitely. Maybe you can help me with. Focus, Ice, Kaori said softly, tapping him on the shoulder. She looked fondly exasperated. This wasn't lost on Aika, who wore a similar expression, her Seraphol, who smiled inwardly as she remembered what a younger Sona had told her. Predictably, both men in the room were clueless. Sorry Akin. We're on the clock. Seraphol sounded regretful, but firm. Ah, right. Sorry about that. Issei rubbed the back of his head, looking around the laboratory, and asked, so, where do I stand? Just lay on the table. You don't need to take your clothes off, or anything. Oh, and please leave the things that look like metal thorns alone. Sure thing is say I'd the aforementioned thorns, scooted away from them, and laid back on the table. The material was an unusual kind of plastic, springy and somewhat cool to the touch. You'll feel a little warm as the scanner does its work, but it'll be done soon, Ajuka told him, then added, probably. I knew you were going to say that, Issei said resignedly. He felt a vague warmth playing across his chest briefly, and then a computerized voice spoke. Accessing Sacred Gear Database. Searching archives match found. High tier creation Sacred Gear, unknown dictator. Also known as the Imperial Child of Machine World. Manifests as a plain iron circlet when unattuned. Enables bearer to remotely manipulate and shape, both in fine and in gross, ferrous objects and electronic devices. Advanced mastery allows bearer to create complex mechanical objects from available ferrous materials. You can sit up now, Issei Kun, Ajuka said. When Issei arose, the Mao looked thoughtful. That's a very rare sacred gear. Very powerful, too, in the hands of someone who has an idea how to use it. No wonder it took a mutation piece to reincarnate you, Ikin. Seraphol sounded pleased. So, is that M field manipulation, or? Issei trailed off. That's probably involved somehow, Ajuka agreed. 
It would take further testing and experimentation to figure out how. I have some time the week after next, if you'd like to meet and do further testing. Would you like me to bring him back down? Seraphil asked curiously. Actually, I think I'll come up, Ajuka said thoughtfully. It's been a long time since I last visited the human world. I'd like to see unknown dictator's performance outside of the laboratory. Sure, sounds good, Issei agreed. Just contact Sona-chan to set up a time, or Mia can I try something? Certainly. If you can bring out your cell phone, please I'm not sure if this will work if I don't have line of sight. Amused, Ajuka fished out his phone, unlocking the screen. A moment later, Issei's line contact data popped up on the display. Issei's phone was nowhere to be seen, and his hands were resting on the tabletop. Ajuka looked almost delighted. Well done. I think you're getting the hang of it already. So you gave a guy you just met your phone number, Ika teased as they walked down the hall. I wish you wouldn't phrase it like that, Issei half grumbled. Well, I think it's nice that you made a new friend, Kaori teased as well, adopting an older sister tone. Making it sound like I just came home from kindergarten whose side are you two on? Issei had descended to full-on grumbling. His classmates exchanged good-natured smirks and chorused, Kaichus. That's probably the correct answer, Seraphil mused, draping an arm around Issei's shoulders. Don't worry, Ikin. Everything will look up after lunch at the Underworld's Best Deli. What's your favorite sandwich? I'm home, Issei announced. Ka-san, Tu-san, I brought Sona-chan and her sister, and they brought takeout for everyone. He stopped short as he saw his parents, blinking. What's going on? Issei. Ryo exclaimed, looking slightly embarrassed. She and Goru were in the middle of bundling up in heavy parkas. He had slung a backpack over one shoulder, and she was lifting one of her own. We were just about to call you. About what? He said slowly, looking back and forth between the two of them. They seemed to be in good spirits, but there was something tense, even brittle, about their mood. Beside him, Sona had an equally quizzical expression. Seraphil looked back and forth between Issei and his parents, her expression politely bemused. We're going out of town for a little bit, Goru said quickly. A friend of the family asked for our help. We may be gone for a few days, so we left the credit card for you on the counter. Oh, where are my manners? Ryo piped up, neatly cutting off Issei's attempt to question them further. She smiled at Seraphil. I'm Haidu Ryo, and this is my husband Goru Kun. I'm sorry, you caught us at a bad time. I'm sorry to intrude. Seraphil bowed quickly. I'm Seraphil. I was in town, visiting So Tan, and I figured I should meet Ikin's family. Issei was silently amazed that she could act, well, adult-like. He probably shouldn't have been, he admitted to himself, but he was anyway. We leave him in your hands, then, Goru said amiably. Hopefully, he's not giving you any trouble. He was drumming his fingertips impatiently on his backpack should strap. He's been a perfect gentleman, the Mayu assured them. He and So Tan are just too cute together. Okay then, Issei said quickly. Tusan, do you want me to unlock the driveway for you? That's okay, we have a ride on the way. Goru shifted the backpack so it was riding more comfortably. We'll probably be gone for a few days. Depending on how things go, we may have a guest coming back with us. A guest, Issei repeated dubiously. Goru checked his wristwatch and turned to his wife. Ryo, it's time. Sona-chan, feel free to keep our boy company while we're gone, Ryo said encouragingly. Seraphal-san, it was nice to meet you. Let's have you over for dinner sometime. Hold the fort while we're gone, Goru said as he opened the front door for Ryo. Ah, sorry to miss out on the takeout. Thanks for the thought, though. Before Issei could ask anything else, they were through the door. Well, that was a thing, Issei said wryly as the door closed. That's really weird. He shrugged. Well, guess that means I get two cents cheesesteak. Not all of it, you don't, Sona chided, shifting the bags full of takeout around. They don't make a habit of that, then. Has your mom always been a homemaker? Ah, no, not without lots of warning. And Kasan. As far as I remember, mostly, but I think she was an art teacher when I was younger, or something like that. Oh, and there was you probably never saw it, but there was an art studio in Kuo for a few years. She worked there as an artist, working with blown glass and pottery. She was really good with anything that involved fire. Issei trailed off as he looked at the door for a moment, then shrugged and grinned at Sona. Well, at least you got permission to stay over. To be perfectly honest, I would even if I hadn't, Sona said with a smirk. Teleportation magic is a wonderful thing. Please try and control yourselves while I'm here, Seraphil said archly, reaching out and shaking the bags of food meaningfully. She looked slightly contemplative for a moment, then seemed to shake it off. I've been wanting stuff from that deli all week. Let's not waste it. I'll take those and dish them up. Why don't the two of you go sit at the table? Issei suggested, taking the bags of food. Thank you, Ikin, Seraphil said gratefully. 
Once he was in the kitchen, she turned to her sister. What is it you wanted to ask me about, So Tan? Did you sense it, too, Wani Sama? Sona asked flatly. Seraphol nodded, her expression surprisingly serious. Yes, I did. Something's doing an excellent job of obscuring it, though. I'd guess wards laid into the house's foundation. She beat her head. If I had to guess, neither of them are fully human. That's my guess, Sona agreed. I'm at a loss as to what they are. The only things I know are that, one, Issei-kun isn't aware. She glanced meaningfully towards the kitchen. Serafo looked thoughtful. Yes. I think I agree. Two. I received unofficial word from the Kyoto faction's observer, Sona said. Apparently the Hyatus have friends in Kyoto, and those friends want to make sure nothing happens to him. She let out a breath. Well, so do I. I know, so Tan, Serafo assured her. Hmm. Well I wouldn't swear to this, not without knowing more, but there is someone with Kyoto affiliations who would have that kind of pull, but is in semi-retirement in an unknown location. She made the finger quotes, making Sona snort. Who is she? She was called the Akaji Haim. Written how? Sona asked, her brows knitting. Seraphol pulled out a notepad, scribbling out the kanji. The Azure Conflagration Princess. That's not a reassuring name, the Citrieris replied, letting her sardonic humor show through. No, not really. Seraphol's tone matched her sister's. Keep in mind that I never actually met her. There's a lot of hyperbole mixed in with her reputation, she warned Sona. Sona nodded, making a go-on gesture. That said, she was supposedly the Shinto faction's most powerful pyrokinetic mage. Something of a magical enforcer, one who worked directly with Yasaka. There were even rumors that she wielded one of the Shinto holy swords. Most of the stories I've heard say that she retired a decade or more ago. Seraphol spread her hands in a there-you-have-it gesture. And that is what I know. Like I said, at least half hyperbole, although it's generally agreed that you don't want to piss her off. Do the ages line up? Sona asked. Maybe. I'd have to go back through the stories I've heard. But, it would fit nicely, wouldn't it? Seraphol looked curiously at her sister. I can forward them to you, if you want. I suppose it would. And I would appreciate that. Sona took a deep breath as she processed that. Finally, she said, please don't tell Issei Kun I asked. I won't, Seraphol assured her. I really don't get the feeling he's aware, either. She fixed her sister with a rare serious look. But I do think you should have a conversation with them in the near future. After all, both you and they have a vested interest in Nick and staying safe. You're right as always, Wani Sama, Sona told her gratefully. So does that mean I can talk you into doing cosplay with me? The Mayu asked suddenly, her eyes lighting up. I never said that. Ikein. Do you want to see So Tan do magical girl cosplay? Sure. Issei's voice came back. Wait, in public, or? Issei Kun? Sona yelled, her cheeks turning cherry red. Yes, public cosplay. I don't care what she cosplays as when you two are alone, Seraphol called back, then amended. Well, I do, but. Well, as long as it's modest Issei's reply was rather more dubious than his first response. Let's just eat, Sona muttered. Despite the embarrassment, she felt rather pleased. Here she was, with her two favorite people in the world, and they were getting along swimmingly. Wednesday. All right, your hand to hand is coming along well, Sona said approvingly. The peerage was assembled on the grounds of a long abandoned mansion a short distance from Kuo proper. Both the student council and the orc made a habit of using the property for combat training. We should start working on your magic. Okay, Issei agreed with a nod. I think I can do stuff with fire. Not very well, though. He glanced at Ria and Aika. I think you two saw it. Ria nodded. He managed a white hot flame long enough to scorch the trainer bitch. Couldn't keep it going long, but under the circumstances, it was amazing that he could do it at all. Aika shrugged. Mostly, I remember her screaming a lot and trying to kill a coon. That's so helpful, Aika-san, Issei groused. He was trying to figure out when he'd given her permission to call him that, and why Ria had immediately latched onto the nickname as well. He was also trying to figure out why he didn't mind hearing it from them. At least it beats Ice-chan, he thought wryly. We can work on it with him, Kaichu, Ria said brightly. I need to start working on combat magic with Ikasan, anyway. All right. Sona shifted her gaze back to her fiancé. Come get me if you guys need a hand. Sure thing, Issei said with a nod, and glanced at his classmate as Sona walked over to join Tsubaki. So, how's magic going for you? Pretty well, Ika said thoughtfully. At least in non-combat stuff. When it comes to actually blowing stuff up well, I think I'm good enough at illusion magic to make you think I've blown stuff up. We all have different talents, Ria assured her. You're doing just fine, all things considered. Yeah, hang in there, Issei told the pawn encouragingly, and turned his gaze to the bishop. What do I do first, then? Concentrate, Ria said encouragingly. 
if you can, do whatever you were doing when it happened the first time. I'd rather not get my windpipe crushed again, thanks, Issei replied with a good-natured smirk. He concentrated, holding out his hands. After a moment, blue-white sparks began dancing along his fingertips. He stared in shock, and they immediately guttered out. That's not a bad start, Ria remarked. Try it again. The half-hour's worth of experimentation had brought them to the breakthrough. Both Ria and Issei would later say that they should have seen it coming. Maybe some kind of gesture, or what's the martial arts word, Tsubasa? Ria asked. She was sitting cross-legged on the ground, the legs of her track pants pushed up around her knees to keep cool. The pens. Tsubasa was sipping from a can of sweet coffee. Think the word you want is stance in this case, though. I know any. Ah, thanks. Issei took the bottle of water Aiko offered and drained it in one go. Thought what you're teaching me is closer to Krav Maga, anyway. Yeah, but Krav Maga has techniques, too. Even if it just cribs them from everyone else, Tsubasa pointed out. Ria's got a point, though. Some kind of stance or gesture that can help you focus. Maybe a word or a thought, if that doesn't work. Ria nodded, her lips pursed in thought. It was a cute look on her, Issei thought. Human magicians often use objects, chants, or gestures as a kind of focus to build a mental framework for doing their magic. Devil magic tends to be more about will or desire. But, if one's not working for you, maybe the other will. Miss A repeated thoughtfully, an idea starting to form. It was a ridiculous one, but what was the old saying? If it's stupid, but it works, it ain't stupid. He stretched and worked his shoulders for a minute before holding his hands up hesitantly. Finally, he leveled his arms, shaping his hands into finger guns. He wouldn't have thought silence could sound simultaneously exasperated and amused. Playing the house of the dead, Ice Chan. Tsubasa said in an amused tone. You did spend a lot of time at the arcade during middle school Murayama said consideringly. Issei distantly wondered why she remembered that or why she knew it in the first place. That seemed unimportant at the moment, though. Even as his friend spoke, he could somehow feel the fire sparking to life, shaping itself into a form he could use. It was as if the finger guns acted as a metaphorical weapon that he was loading the fire into. That was as close as he could come to describing the thought process and feeling. What happened, from the perspective of the rest of Sona's peerage, was that searing blue-white flames erupted into life around Issei's hands. It burned brightest around the fingers that formed the barrel of his finger guns. How's this? He asked. That's great. Ria enthused, looking like she was about to start clapping. It's unorthodox, but it's working, and that's the important thing. No magical circles, either again, that's unusual, but not unprecedented, and the results are hard to argue with, she grinned brightly at Issei. I think you may be a natural pyrokinetic. Akaji, Sona said softly. Issei looked at her in confusion. What? Azure conflagration. He paused, thinking about that. I kinda like the sound of that. Just something I heard recently, Sona said quickly. That's very good, Issei Kun. Very good, indeed. Sona's violet eyes were fixed intently on him. Approval and affection mingled in her gaze and were leaking into her tone. The wall there. Use it until it crumbles. She indicated the concrete wall on the abandoned mansion grounds they were using for combat training. It was nearly 20 meters long and nearly a meter thick. That made it nearly ideal for devils testing their strength and magical power. Rebuilding it also made good endurance training for devils with talent and earth magic. Yeah, he replied, his tone oddly eager. He took a deep breath, taking careful aim at the northern end of the wall, and thrust his hands forward, miming a firing gesture. The blue-white flames lashed out, exploding as they impacted the thick concrete wall. When the smoke cleared, they had left deep craters in the concrete, with cracks starting to spiderweb throughout its structure. At Sona's encouraging nod, Issei fired both finger guns again and again and again. It took a dozen repetitions for his flame to start weakening, and by that point, the northernmost three meters of wall were either smoking rubble or in the process of becoming so. Enough, Sona told him, and Issei relaxed his hands, the fire guttering out as he did. He slumped his shoulders, letting out a sigh of relief. Another bottle of water bounced off his chest, hitting the ground. So much for those rook reflexes, I could teased. Rooks don't have superhuman reflexes, you know, he retorted, leaning down to pick up the bottle. He drained it dry in one gulp. Interesting, Ria said, leaning forward. She took his hands, peering intently at them. That's a totally different kind of fire than you manifested that night. Fire's fire, right? Issei asked, looking perplexed. Maybe this is just burning hotter, or something. Um, maybe Ria said, looking thoughtful, still studying his hands with great interest. Blue flames are kind of distinctive, though. Yes, they are. Tsubaki spoke for the first time since the training session began, and her eyes were half closed in thought. I think I've seen that somewhere before, as well. Issei laughed nervously. 
He wasn't sure how he felt about them probing about his pyrokinesis, especially given that he understood next to nothing about it himself. I think I'll call that the wreck of Dan. Conflagration bullet. It fits, Ria said, smiling brightly. Maybe next time I will depend on you where the psycho crow is concerned. You gonna start reading his palm next, Ria. I could tease playfully. The bishop flushed slightly, dropping Issei's hands. He felt both relief and disappointment about that and tried to shake the ladder off. That's excellent progress, Sona said, cutting off any further awkwardness. We'll work on improving your magical endurance, but for the first night of doing something like that, it's staggering. She gave him an appraising look. Normally the devils specialized in long-distance attacks or bishops or knights skilled with firearms. The latter are relatively uncommon, though. The rook who can engage effectively at all ranges will have a distinct advantage. Thanks, Issei said, blushing and rubbing the back of his head. Bossa chan still got the edge with actually hitting people, though. And don't you forget it, Tsubasa said in a mock-threatening tone. I prefer getting in there and mixing it up, anyway. This way, you can snipe an old slug. I do like it when my peerage does the division of labor for me, Sona said, in a dry tone. Her eyes and smile made it clear she approved, though, and a chuckle rippled through the rest of them. Now, Issei-kun, before we break for tonight, I'd like you to try using that fire in close combat. Issei nodded. With Basa-chan, or. The wall again will suffice. This will be more for proof of concept than anything else. Okay. Let's see ah, Basa-chan, can you show me that stance again? Tsubasa nodded and slid easily into the Krav Maga fighting stance. Issei eyed her for a moment, purely to gauge the proper form, no other reason at all, then emulated it. He shifted his dominant foot slightly back and raised his hands to chin level. He paused, shifting the right hand slightly forward and then canted his arms at 90 degree angles. His fingers curled into fists and as he did so, he felt the fire starting to bubble to life again. This time, the blue-white flame burned brightest around his knuckles. At Sona's nod, he launched himself at the wall, throwing punch after punch. His rook strength would have been enough to leave visible dents in the concrete before, but the explosions as his fire-wreathed fist struck the wall added a remarkable concussive force. Now that he was close enough to see, that blue-white flame disappeared as it exploded against the wall, and he somehow felt the fire slowly seeping back into him. It was almost as though it were a nearly inexhaustible resource, even as it faltered and guttered. By the time he was finished, that 30-meter long wall had been cut down to 23 meters. The rest was smoking rubble. Issei wiped his brow with the back of his head and turned back towards the others. He saw them all staring at the damage wrought and at him. He tugged down his shirt, trying to hide the fact that he was more than a little excited right now. Sona's eyes quietly hinted that she shared the feeling. Excellent, Issei-kun, Sona said, a certain earthiness slipping subtly into her tone. At the very least, those who knew her well could hear it. Issei tried to ignore the amused side eye Tsubaki was giving her king. Good work, everyone. Call it a day. Aika looked like she was about to comment, but Tsubasa cut her off with a round of obvious throat clearing. Sona ignored them. Thursday. Issei narrowed his eyes in concentration, focusing on maintaining and traversing the gateway. Magic wasn't coming to him as easily as he'd hoped. Aika had taken to it like a fish to water, to a point where the bishops were already teaching her intermediate techniques. And, in all fairness, he was learning some kinds of magic with ease. The kinds of magic that involved shooting or blowing stuff up with fire or lightning, for example. It was a little scary just how easily he was taking to those. But something as delicate and complex as teleportation magic. That was taking every ounce of concentration, even what with there being an anchor on the summoner's side. Sona said it would come easier with time, but he wasn't convinced. At least he was only doing the one contract this afternoon and he'd have the rest of the night with his fiance. Finally, that dinner. Time alone with Sona aside, he'd heard some really good things about Silver Moon Stakes. He felt the final tug that Ria had advised him about and mentally reached for the source. That snapped him through the passage and he had to drop to one knee for a minute, catching his breath and his bearings. That finally done, he rose, starting to recite the boilerplate Sona had taught him. He stopped short as he realized who he was looking at. Onizuka-sensei. He said in disbelief. Haidu-kun. The vice principal stared at him in shock. What are are you a devil? Onizuka Azusa actually half recoiled from him. I I suppose that tracks with the rumors she steeled herself with visible effort and said with brittle courage. I I humbly request your assistance. I I'm willing to pay whatever price. Issei had started sweating the moment she recognized him. Um, sensei, you don't have to worry about something like that, he said quickly, trying to head off her panic at the pass. I don't do that crap anymore, I'm engaged. He cleared his throat. Um. Tell me what you need help with and I'll see what I can do. 
Don't see why you can't just tell your husband what you're getting him for his birthday, Issei commented 45 minutes later. The Kichi Kun is convinced that I don't know about his boss's Oku days, back before we met. He thinks he's cleaned up after himself well enough. Onizuka sensei's expression was one of exasperated affection for her husband. Issei had a sneaking suspicion that Sona often wore that same look when thinking about him. I wanted to find something from those days to show him that I love and accept all of him. And to show him that he can't put one over on you, Issei thought whimsically. Ah, well. This was probably a foretaste of the future, and the flavor tasted all right. Well, this site has a pretty good rep. Ah, if you don't want to chance it with your card, I have a you can use. Really? Thank you, Haidu-kun. The vice principal glanced at the slip of paper he showed her and began a funds transfer via line. As they waited in companionable silence, she asked, what's it like, being a devil? I let you know when I figured that out for myself, he said in a clearly joking tone. She didn't seem to get the joke, but the funds showed up in his at just that moment, so it hardly mattered. He double-checked the site. You're sure this is who he rode with? At her affirmative nod, he placed the order, double-checking the delivery address. A post office box that, what seemed like a lifetime ago, he used to have his porn and arage sent to. Odd thing to feel nostalgic about, he thought. Done. One taco fuku, on the way. Really? Onizuka sensei looked delighted. More than that, she looked relieved, like a heavy burden had just been lifted from her shoulders. Thank you, Haidu kun. She sobered. Um, what do you feel is a fair payment? Here. Issei set a slip of paper on Sona's computer desk. She picked it up, peering at it. An account number. For the student council budget, Issei explained. It's under your control now. Sona Citri's control, not the Kaichu's. For the next five years. It's also been bumped up by 20%. He grinned. All for the price of helping the vice principal track some of her husband's stuff down from his boss's Oku days. Sona gave him an approving look. Very clever, Issei Kun. That'll be quite useful for us. Thanks. He reached out, pulling her gently to her feet. What's this? She said, bemused but game. I just think I deserve a kiss for completing my first contract, he said, a surprisingly shy note in his voice. Oh, she said, considering this with all due gravity. I suppose that's fair she draped her arms around his neck, drawing him down for a deep kiss. As it broke, he started to lean in for a second, but she placed a hand on his chest. Hold that thought. There's something on the chair for you. For me? Issei said wonderingly, picking up the garment bag. Beeping his head curiously, he unzipped it and pulled out a charcoal gray suit on a hanger. Accompanying it was a crimson silk dress shirt and a dark blue silk necktie. Both eyebrows raised, he turned toward Sona. This is great, Sona-chan how much did this set you back, though? It was a drop in the bucket, Sona said reassuringly. And that's because of what happened to your dress clothes the last time we tried to have dinner. Her cheeks pinked slightly. I'm afraid I had to go through your clothes to get the sizes correct. It's tailored for you, though. Nice, Issei said, and meant it. I'll get changed, then. I'll do likewise, she said, rising from her desk. This once, I'll ask you not to peek, she added with a slight smirk. This once, he said with a sheepish smile. By the time she emerged, Issei had donned a suit and shirt, though he was struggling to knot the necktie. He started to ask her for help, but ended up just staring at her. Sona was now wearing a knee-length blue-gray silk dress with a full skirt and spaghetti-strapped bodice. A transparent blue wrap was worn around her shoulders. Her cheeks were slightly pink as she felt her eyes on him. How do I look? She asked quietly. Amazing. Sona Chan, you're beautiful, Issei insisted, taking her hands. Thank you. She seemed to relax, her eyes taking him in admiringly. You're quite handsome yourself. Does the suit fit okay? Yeah, it fits great. You have a good tailor. Our family tailor is good at that sort of thing, she answered. We'll see about getting you some more suits, then. She reached up, starting to fiddle with his tie. Let me get that for you. This feels nice, Issei told her. The scene felt almost like a domestic cliché, but a comfortable and happy one. It does, she agreed as she finished nodding the necky dot I suppose that was a very husband-wife thing to do. I sure won't complain about it, he assured her, and offered her his arm. With a smile, she took it. That was great, Issei said with a soft laugh, and Sona smiled in response. Indeed, the dinner at Silver Moon had been everything that the reviews claimed, and the stories about their stakes had proven true. Both Sona and Issei had kept watching the door at first, half expecting something to explode, but by the time they were perusing the dessert menu, they had fully relaxed. I don't imagine I can talk you into calling out sick tomorrow, he joked as they approached his front door. I'm tempted, but no, Sona told him. If when Isama hadn't had to take you to Lucifer on Tuesday, perhaps, but no. She looked thoughtful, and Issei wondered whether he should ask what was on her mind. 
I figured, he said instead. He unlocked the door, standing aside so she could enter before following her inside. Want anything to drink? Ice water is fine, thank you, she said, taking the suitcase and heading for the stairs. Issei headed straight for the kitchen, busying himself with fixing the drinks. He didn't realize Sona had come back down the stairs until he felt her arm slip around his waist. He started for a moment, then relaxed, reaching down to squeeze her hands. Hi. Hi, she answered, her voice slightly muffled. After a moment, her voice said thoughtfully, I texted Tsubaki. We'll skip club events tomorrow. A night off, huh? He said, turning around to face her. He was careful not to dislodge her arms from around her waist and rested his own hands on her shoulders. I like it. And maybe this weekend we can have another date night, a more informal one, Sona continued with a smile. Provided Kuo doesn't banish in a cataclysm. Dust watch the frigging singularity happen Saturday afternoon, Issei said dryly. Sure, I'm game. And one more thing, Sona added. I don't think anything will be harmed if we miss the first two classes tomorrow. Okay, I'm good with that. But why the schedule change, Sona-chan? He handed her one of the glasses. She took a long drink. Because I want tomorrow to be fairly low-key. Because you and I are going to be late getting to school. Sona fixed him with a look whose meaning was unmistakable. Issei's face flushed, and he felt his heart start to race. The glass in his hand trembled for a moment, and he had to set it down. Sure what brings this on, though? Are you sure? He reached for her hands. I've been wanting you for a very long time, Anada, she told him, her cheeks a fetching shade of pink. Sona touched his face tenderly, and he leaned into her touch. Especially this week. Even though we've hardly been chased at all perhaps especially because of that. She set down her glass and leaned close, giving him a long, lingering kiss. By the time she released him, both of them were panting, and Issei was flabbergasted as to how anyone could think Sona Citri a cold fish. Take me to bed, now. Please. Issei nodded tersely, pulling her to her feet. Before she could say another word, he lifted her in a bridal carry and started walking towards the stairs. Sona's face was a little red, but that didn't keep her from wearing a tremulously pleased smile. He knew that his expression mirrored hers. Friday. Did you see how much she was humming this morning? And Akun was really tight-lipped about last night, aside from talking about his steak. Is Silver Moon steak really that good? I've seen their menu prices. They had better be that good. Not to mention when they arrived. Two classes late. Despite the topic of conversation, there was none of the petty sniping that often accompanied such discussions. The student counselors sounded nothing if not pleased for their president and her fiancé. Ladies. Tsubasa, Ria, and Momo turned their attention to Tsubaki. The queen cleared her throat. We really shouldn't be speculating about our king and Haidu kun sex life. That said she opened her notebook. Who had today? The first three girls exchanged glances, and Ria raised her hand. Then you win the pool, Tsubaki said, and the other girls grumbled, reaching for their wallets. I'm surprised you didn't bet on today, Fukakechu, Tsubasa commented as she passed a 2,000 yen note to Ria. I bet on last Thursday, the vice president said, sounding slightly put out. Straightforward stray devil hunt huh? Issei panted. Please tell me fallen angels and their mooks aren't part of the standard pack again. No, they certainly are not, Sona retorted. Special just for you, Ikun, Ria said, somehow managing to maintain a degree of verve. For your very first stray hunt. Oh, don't feel you have to put yourself out for my benefit. The three of them spun at the same time, Issei unleashing a wreck at Dan Flurry, while Sona let fly with a dozen spears of boiling water. The former attack took two of the mooks in the breed biscuit, knocking them backwards with a series of explosions and setting their coats momentarily ablaze. The latter turned into sinuous hissing serpents as they struck the statuesque blue-haired fallen angel, constricting around her and immediately superheating. The screams actually made the devils wince. As the smoke and steam cleared, Ria summoned a dozen magical circles, each one wreathed in lightning. They all fired simultaneously, each bolt zeroing in on the fallen angel's head. At the relatively close range, they cored between her eyes, and she dropped like a marionette whose strings had been cut. That had probably been a mercy, at this point. Are they dead? Issei asked softly. He sounded like he was on the verge of hyperventilating. Probably, Ria said tersely, before picking up on his tone. Ikun. She patted his cheek, looking at him intently. Stay with us, here. Sona inwardly winced. This was something she neglected to cover, but at the same time, it was best he run into this now. She, too, moved to Issei's side, touching his shoulder. Issei Kun, she said, her tone soft but urgent. Ria's right. I understand, but we don't have time to dwell on it. We need to keep moving. He nodded, forcing his breathing to slow. When he replied, his tone was terse but calm. Gotcha. Run, she ordered. The campus. 
Arok and her bishop nodded, and the three of them sprinted for the dubious safety of Kuo Academy's campus. It really had been intended as a straightforward stray devil hunt, one that had come down on them at the last minute. They had Visor's description and the approximate geographical area she'd been sighted in. Sona had expected to spend a few hours running her to ground, another hour either arranging for her transport or her disposal, and then have a movie night in with a say. That would have been a nice way to end the week, and one thing they'd found they shared was a tongue-in-cheek fondness for movies with ridiculous depictions of technology. All a say had to do was say United States government, and the two of them would dissolve in snickers. Things had gone sideways the moment the fallen angels appeared. Sona had no idea how Visor had gotten into contact with them, or how she'd persuaded them to help her. It didn't matter much, though, because the fallen angel and a half-dozen human agents had appeared just as Sona, Issei, and Ria had closed in. Tsubaki had the rest of the peerage approaching from the other direction, and they had actually run into Visor, along with two more fallen angels. Tsubaki. Sona wrapped out into the communications circle. What's your status? No one harmed at present, Kaichu, Tsubaki replied calmly. Approaching the campus from the south side, with crows and their lackeys in pursuit. Estimate three minutes out. Understood, Sona acknowledged with a sharp nod. Have you informed Rias? Rias Senpai has been informed. Kibakun is preparing a trap on the east side of the old schoolhouse, and Rias Senpai recommends you aim for there. The east side of the old schoolhouse. Thank you Tsubaki. See you shortly. Sona made a sharp gesture, dismissing the communication circle. As they sprinted through the school gates, they could see a melee already forming. Kiba, a Jan-like sword in his grip, was hopping around, squared off against a fallen angel, while a half-dozen people wearing the garb of church exorcists tried to outflank him. Considering their outfits, the latter were probably rogues who had gone running to Grigori for one unsavory reason or another. Sona chan he's got the ground littered with stuff, Issei said suddenly. Iron filings or something. Ah, I see it, Sona said tersely. After a moment, she heard Issei grunt in agreement. Kiba was doing his best to keep them clustered in the same general area trying to draw as many of them as he could into the mouth of the trap. And, with the iron filings scattered around. All at once, a dozen swords popped out of the earth around Kiba, thrust point down into the turf. The knight literally bounced out of the area, his attackers turning to track him visually. And with a sweet laugh, Himijima Akeno demonstrated why she was nicknamed the Priestess of Thunder. Her signature lightning magic streaked downward, attracted by the ferrous items Kiba had left littered around his opponents. Some of them actually survived but none of them were in any condition to continue the battle. We need to get to Visor, Sona said, as much to remind herself as to remind Issei and Ria. They made noises of agreement, and they kept moving. Sona-chan, Visor's got something. It looks like one of those reinforced rolling suitcases. In the heat of battle, neither of them had noticed Issei lapsing into the more private form of addressing her. They've got her staying back out of the melee, Ria agreed. She was sticking close to Sona and keeping a magical shield active. That acid spraying technique she's using is surprisingly long-ranged, if she's not hitting her allies. Issei Kun, retrieve the suitcase, Sona ordered tersely. Tsubasa, Kaori, back him up. Roger that. Issei dashed forward at full speed, opening fire as he went. The wreck of Dan detonations left blinding flashes of light and massive craters in the schoolyard, driving back the rogue exorcists that they didn't blow over. On it. Tsubasa surged out on Issei's heels. Even if she lacked a knight speed, her athletic nature enabled her to keep pace with him, and she dispatched the sword-wielding exorcist on Issei's tail with a vicious chop. The next one took a fist charged with demonic energy to the nose, his head crumpling from the sheer power behind the punch. Murayama just charged in without a word. Her Bakken had been reinforced with magic and was wreathed in demonic energy, making it a credible threat to even fallen angels. With a defiant cry, she drove it into the nearest rogue exorcist's gut, whirling the wooden sword up and around, before bringing it crashing down on his head. Lights out. Issei, heedless of the threats his friends were pruning out from behind him, had eyes only for the suitcase and the one holding it. Visor herself. The stray devil was looming up behind her allies, spraying acid from her beep like a machine gun. Some distant part of Issei's mind was mortally offended by beep being used for that. The firestorm of lactating acid paused as she noticed his approach. You think you can take me down? She sneered, her distorted voice ringing out like a warped church bell. Well, I figured I'd try, he said with a shrug, and opened fire. He'd been keeping mental track of his record and clip, and he knew he was low, so these shots had to count. They were aimed at Visor's front legs, or the area around them. The monster-like stray devil snarled and tried to writhe out of the way, but Issei's last shot was sure, and her left front leg all but disintegrated in a blossom of blue-white flame. She shrieked as she sank to the ground, and the rook leapt up and drove his left fist into her face with all his might. She was sent sprawling, colliding hard with the wall. 
Ice. Ice Chan. It was amazing how much their abrupt presence seemed to energize him. The flickering flames around his hands blazed back up to full strength and he threw himself at the stray devil again. Visor's shrieks became louder, more desperate, as his fists found her again, this time wreathed in flames that licked her flesh away. Her body lurched again, and Issei became vaguely aware that Murayama had shattered the stray devil's other front leg, partially immobilizing her. We'll just be taking this, thank you Tsubasa hefted the rolling suitcase like it was an empty grocery bag. She signaled to Tamo, who had just finished subduing another rogue exorcist, and pitched it like a baseball. Sona's other knight scrambled to catch it. Don't get so far ahead of us next time, Murayama said, panting for a moment. Issei heard the worried chiding in her voice and had to smile. Fine, fine, I won't. He looked down at Visor. Had enough. Funk you. She snarled. Her once beautiful face was a mass of bruises and third-degree burns, and one eye was swollen shut, but her voice was still defiant. Tsubasa and Murayama exchanged glances and lunged. A moment later, Visor was screaming again as the Rukin knight took her back legs out of play. Issei hopped back as they moved, resuming a Rekka dance stance and keeping his finger guns trained on the stray devil's face. Fine Visor finally managed, voice laced with pain and defeat. I surrender. Aichu, she surrendered, Tsubasa called out. As she. Sona's voice was chilly with contempt. It would be one thing, had you surrendered in the first place. But you fled to the fallen angels. Rias nodded solemnly. That could be considered treason. What was left of Visor's face suddenly paled in terror. No. Sona looked towards the surviving fallen angels. Which of you is the senior one? The blonde girl dressed in eagle fashion sighed and said, I suppose that's me right now. She was in little position to argue, seeing that Tsubaki had the blade of her Najinata pressed up against her throat and wreathed in demonic flame. Aika was beside her, looking rather pleased with herself. Somehow, the pawn had half encased the other fallen angel up to his neck in an impenetrable mound of dirt. The lilac-haired man looked rather perturbed, and understandably so. Did you promise the stray devil sanctuary? Sona asked coldly. We agreed to discuss terms, she said carefully. We hadn't come to an agreement yet. Bitch. Visor cried out. That suitcase she was carrying the blonde started to say. We'll be taking possession of that, Rhea said, her tone brooking no argument. In exchange, we'll let you take your associates and leave, and we'll won't mention this to Azazel. Sona looked less than pleased at the last part of the offer, but didn't argue. She gestured to Aika and Tsubaki, who released their captives, but didn't relax their guard. The blonde fallen angel didn't look happy with it either. She nodded, though, nodding to her companion. The tall man with long lilac hair shrugged and began summoning teleportation circles. We'll let you deal with her, the blonde added, nodding towards Visor. We got what we wanted, anyway. You'll regret leaving me like this, Visor seethed. Oh, I already regret dealing with you, Blondie shot back as she stepped into her own circle. Within minutes, the Academy's campus was clear of the fallen angels and their mooks. The eyes turned back towards Visor. Wait, she protested weakly. Say Kun. If you would, please. Sona's voice was calmer now, but he could still hear the anger in it. I'll make this quick, Issei told Visor. He wasn't surprised by the brief flash of guilt. No, it was that he wasn't feeling guiltier. Before she could start pleading, he opened fire at point-blank range. From that close, with no resistance, the wreck of Dan blew her head apart. Eventually, he was aware of Sona resting a hand on his arm. Her violet eyes peered at him concernedly. Let's go, she said softly. Issei let out a breath, letting his flames die out, and reached for her hand. She squeezed back, and he let her pull him away from the battleground. They actually had sacred gears here. Rhea said wonderingly. From the people they killed. The two peerages were holding a brief post-mortem in the student council office, before dismissing to grab a late dinner. Tsubaki had suggested they actually look in the damned suitcase, and what they found in a strictly material sense justified what they had experienced this evening. It appears that way, Sona sighed, then straightened up. Not that they'll get any use out of them now. The two high-class devils shared a knowing smirk. The idea that they have ways of extracting them won't help me sleep at night, Tsubaki said sourly. I feel uneasy enough that we do. And that we have no idea who they were taken from. It bothers me as well, Sona agreed. But there is little we can do about that, and we may as well benefit. She shifted her gaze towards Rias. There are three that we managed to recover. Because you helped us subdue them on school grounds, I'll give you one. Rias didn't sound fully satisfied with that. After a moment, she countered, only if I get to choose the one I take. Sona nodded curtly. Issei was pretty sure that was what she'd anticipated from the beginning, though. His fiance was a drop-dead brilliant girl, who just happened to be beautiful. Ria's gestured to the office's coffee table. Let's see what you have. 
Sona opened the gym bag and extracted the recovered sacred gears, setting them on the student council office's coffee table. Dot for all that they had been fought over, the objects didn't look very impressive. A pendant-sized silver sword, a blue marble-like sphere whose surface shone oddly, and what looked like a case for contact lenses. Rias pulled out the case that Ajuka had sent up with Serafal and extracted what looked like a barcode scanner. She thumbed it on and first pointed it at the blue marble. A harsh red light swept over its surface, not unlike a mortal scanning laser. Accessing Sacred Gear Database, the scanner announced. Searching archives match found. Mid-tier state change Sacred Gear, Momentum Pillage. Also known as Impetuous Thief of Alacrity. Derived from a cast-off jewel from Divine Dividing and manifests as a small blue sphere when unattuned to a bear. Sacred Gear drains speed from an opponent and transfers it to the bear. Divine Dividing? Ika wondered. Divine Dividing is a long inus, Rias explained quickly. Those are the most powerful sacred gears, said to be capable of killing even gods. It has the soul of the vanishing dragon, Albion, inside it. She glanced at Issei. Some high-tier sacred gears are said to have the potential to develop into long inuses, Haidu Kun. Yours is one of them. Issei raised both eyebrows. No wonder that Raynor wanted my head. Akeno whistled softly. My, my. Imagine how useful this would be for Kibakun or Kaneko-chan, Rias. Indeed, the Redeed agreed, looking speculatively at the tiny sphere. She turned the scanner towards the small case. Accessing Sacred Gear Database. Searching archives match found. High-tier attribute elemental sacred gear, Storm Dancer. Also known as Luminous Gale of the Firmament. Manifests as a pair of blue contact lenses when unattuned to a bear. When attuned, manifests as a permanent bluish tinge to the bear's eyes and as a faint aura of static electricity surrounding the bear when active. Sacred Gear allows its bearer to use electrokinesis reflexively to enhance defensive and offensive actions, as well as enhancing the usage of lightning and thunder magic, and exercises limited control over the weather. Rias looked at Storm Dancer in pleased surprise. Well, then. I can think of some good uses for this one, as well. She exchanged smiles with Akeno, and then eyed the last item, as if she had some idea of what it was, and played the scanner's light across it. Accessing Sacred Gear database, it announced helpfully. Searching archives match found. Mid-tier creation elemental sacred gear, Mind's Edge. Also known as the Sword of Unshattered Will. Manifests as a plain-looking sword's hilt when unattuned. Allows bearer to create a photokinetic blade from their own spiritual energy and wield it with the hilt. The blade thusly created is superior to the mass-produced holy weapons used by church exorcists, though still inferior to a true holy sword. Blades thusly created have manipulable lengths and appearances, as does the hilt once attuned. Amo whistled. I like the sound of that. The say began, so, it's the sacred gear equivalent of. Don't say it, please, Sona said quickly. But it is, though, Issei mumbled. He didn't actually say the word, though, and Sona settled for giving him a mild old-fashioned look. Ria got one as well, for stage whispering use the force, Luke could say. Ria's eyed mind's edge longingly, then smiled resignedly. I only have the one knight, and Yudo already possesses sword birth. If it were blade blacksmith, I'd claim it in a heartbeat, but she shrugged. I'll take Storm Dancer. She plucked the contact lens case from the coffee table and turned towards Akeno. When we get back, we'll see about attuning it to you. The elegant queen nodded, her smile turning slightly sadistic. Issei had a suspicion she was already thinking about the damage she could do to her chosen targets with that. He decided to do everything he could to avoid being one of them. Then we'll take possession of these, Sona agreed, shifting her gaze towards her knights. Tamo, you will receive Mind's Edge. Kaori, we'll arrange for something more specifically for you soon, but I believe Tamo will be willing to loan you her katana in the interim. Tamo grinned excitedly and nodded in agreement. Kaori answered, I can live with that. As for momentum pillage, I think Tsubasa will get the most use out of it, the student council president decided. Tsubasa perked up and she and a safe fist bumped. Sounds like a good place to call it a day, Rias noted and rose. I'll touch base with you tomorrow. Certainly, Sona replied and saw the orc president and her peerage to the door. Once they were gone, she turned back towards her own servants. She has a point. Head on home. Issei waited until the others had left, watching her stow the remaining sacred gears in the suitcase. Want me to get that for you? He offered. She nodded. Thank you. As he set it down and extended its handle, she reached for his free hand, interlacing her fingers with his. How are you feeling? Better, I think. Calmer, at least. Less like I committed murder. Issei did look more controlled now, but clearly the night's events were still weighing on him. I'm actually a little bothered about Visor it's not that I didn't feel guilty. It's that I felt less guilty than I expected. You didn't commit murder, Issei-kun, Sona told him, her tone reassuring yet insistent. 
The Grigori agents initiated the hostilities and sustained them. And Visor. The chances that she would quietly surrender and go back to the underworld were always slim. She reached up, tipping his chin down so she could look up into his eyes. At worst, you were a soldier in a battle today. And none of those around you were non-combatants. You're no murderer, hi do say. He closed his eyes, letting out a sigh, and finally nodded. I may need you to keep telling me that for a while, Sona-chan. I will. Sona's look that was firm and resolute and no less loving for all that. My peerage does not commit murder or atrocities. That doesn't mean that we won't kill if necessary. Things like today will happen again, say kun I know, he told her, his expression mildly rueful. Intellectually, I did know that. The reality hadn't really sunken in. It's understandable. But you've done nothing wrong. Trust me. Sona sighed. I think I should probably have a similar talk with Kaori and Aika tomorrow. Might be a good idea, Issei admitted. Kaori-san's family has a kinjutsu background, so she may have some idea of how to deal with it. I dunno about Aika-san, though. He smiled slightly, his body language showing that he was starting to genuinely relax. Thanks for you know. Hearing me out. Always, Sona told him. Things like these take adjusting to. Honestly, I would be far more worried if you'd felt nothing or had enjoyed that. She beeped her head. Are you ready? Whenever you are, he said, holding her hand tightly. Now, let's go watch a movie made by people who have no idea how the internet works, she said with a wry smile. You always know the perfect thing to say, he chuckled, tugging her towards the door. Saturday. So, where do you want to go tonight? Issei asked. I'm open to suggestions, Sona replied with a sardonic smile. It had been a half Saturday at school, and most of the early afternoon had been spent on council business. Now, they were walking back to Issei's house together, openly holding hands. You have something in mind, Issei Kun. That changed and hopped the train to Tokyo. He suggested. Maybe hit a kibba for dinner in Karaik. MMM. I could be persuaded, she said, her eyes slightly mischievous. Um, really? Issei's grin turned mischievous too. He started to speak, then paused as his phone started playing the last verse from Year of the Cat. His brows knit and he pulled out his phone, answering it. Tusan. He paused, then said, you guys are home, then. Yeah, Sona-chan and I are just about there. Another pause, then he said uncomfortably, we didn't have anything set in stone. Why, what's up? Sona beeped her head, looking at him curiously as they walked. Well, we'll see you in a minute and talk about it right, be right there. He hung up, looking bemused. Everything okay? Sona asked, her eyebrows knitting. And that's kind of an old song. It's two cents favorite. Think it reminds him of an old girlfriend or something, Issei answered distractedly. And yeah, probably. I just hate it when Tucson gets vague and sounds like he thinks he's clever. Issei made a face. The guest they're talking about is with him, and I guess they really want us to meet her. It's probably nothing, Issei Kuhn, Sona advised him. They did say she's a family friend, after all. It's probably someone you haven't seen in years. By this point, they had reached his front door. As so, he replied with a shrug as he unlocked the door. They stepped inside, Issei calling out, Ka-san, Tu-san, we're home. Welcome home, son. Gora's voice rang out cheerfully. Come into the living room, we have someone we want you to meet. Issei and Sona exchanged glances as they doffed their shoes and entered the living room. Boru and Ryo sat on the couch, looking little the worse for wear. For some reason, Issei's father's hair seemed oddly windblown, but both of them seemed to be in good spirits. Beside them sat a pretty young blonde woman, roughly Issei's age. She wore a simple-looking white blouse and green skirt and smiled nervously. Her green eyes were friendly, but the nervousness in them matched her smile. Have a seat, you two, Ryo urged them. As Issei and Sona did so, she turned towards the blonde girl. Asia Chan, this is our son Issei and his fiancée Sona. I think you probably met him a long time ago when your aunt brought you here that one time. Issei, Sona Chan, this is Asia Argento. Nice to meet you, Asia Chan, Issei said, feeling oddly awkward. Something about the girl was oddly familiar. The memory was oddly murky and slippery, though, defying his attempts to get a grip on it. This is Sona-chan. I'm pleased to meet you, Asia-san, Sona said cordially. Nice to meet you both as well, Asia replied, bobbing her head awkwardly. Asia-chan is the niece of an old friend of ours, Ryo explained. For a moment, an odd something flashed through her eyes, as if a bad memory had reared its head. She'll be staying with us for a while, and we'd like to test her for attending Kuo as well. We can probably arrange that, Sona said, before looking back at Asia. I'm the student council president and Issei Kuhn is on the council as well. Issei nodded. I'd be happy to help you study for the tests. Ryo nodded in approval. Asia Chan will be with us for a while, Issei, so if you could be kind of a big brother to Issei. Issei blinked. 
That felt so familiar, sounded so familiar. You'll be a good big brother to Asia, won't you, Isai-chan? A woman with long blonde hair, a gentle smile, an unusual accent. Isai-kun. Isai. Isai blinked again, suddenly aware of everyone's eyes on him. Where had that come from? Ah, sorry, zoned out for a minute, he said awkwardly. Um, yeah, sure. I'll do that. He gave Asia a grin, adding, I guess that makes Sona-chan your big sister. Indeed it does, Sona said, giving Issei a sideways look of concern. After watching him for a moment, apparently satisfying herself he was okay now, she turned back towards Asia. Feel free to count on us. Asia's smile lost its nervousness, brightening considerably. Sure. Thank you. As night fell over Kuo, a man stood on one of the hills overlooking it. His features were handsome, but the self-impressed sneer detracted from his looks. He had grayish-white hair and an uneven bowl cut in Sarah's eyes, and wore the clothes of a church exorcist. Those clothes were rather worn looking by this point, but that seemed of little importance to him. Kuo, he said in a tone that matched his sneer. Just wait, you shitty devils. That sneer broadened into a leer. Just wait, Asia. End of the here. So that's it for today's video guys, before you go just like the video and share it with your friends. Bye.